Register Phenomena Code 108 Object Class Alpha Red Hazard Types Sensory Hazard Sentient Hazard Ideological Hazard Containment Protocols The entrance leading to RPC-108 is to be monitored at all times. Any unauthorized personnel entering the vicinity of RPC-108 are to be captured and administered Class A-1 amnestics in order to remove any memory of RPC-108 and its location. Class A-1 amnestics cause complete loss of all memories formed in the previous two to six hours. This grade is very stable. Chance of unintended side effects are virtually negligible, except in rare circumstances. After exploration number 1546-3, which resulted in deaths, further research and exploration on RPC-108 have been prohibited. Description. RPC-108 is a sewer located in France, which can only be accessed by a singular entry point located in RPC-108 appears as a structure two meters tall with brick walls. On the floor of RPC-108 is a thick black liquid of unknown origin. This liquid is present throughout the entire known length of the sewers, and is seemingly unable to leak out of RPC-108 to media area. The tunnel of RPC-108 appears to be structurally unstable, though it shows no signs of imminent collapse. It is unknown how far the tunnel of RPC-108 extends and, as of yet, no discernible end to the tunnel of RPC-108 has been detected. Attempts to access RPC-108 by any means, other than its main entrance, will result in failure. So far, no way of breaking RPC-108 has been found. Any attempts to permanently modify RPC-108, such as installing metal bars on the entrance, were unsuccessful, as within 24 hours, it would anomalously revert back to its original state. During all explorations of RPC-108, subjects will, at some point, encounter RPC-108-1 which appears as two glowing eyes just out of reach of the subject's touch, blending in with the darkness. The nature of RPC-108-1 remains unknown, as there have been no direct encounters with it, and the anomaly does not exhibit any aggression or hostile intent, with the exception of stalking the subject, causing a great amount of fear of the subject. It is unknown whether or not the psychological effects are caused by anomalous effects or is simply a natural reaction. Addendum: RPC-108 travels in a completely linear path, with no turns or course deviations present. Subjects claim to hear a constant dripping sound of unknown origin, which moves as shown in Exploration Log No. 1546-1. The interior of RPC-108 cannot be illuminated from the outside, and lighting sources no brighter than 124 watts have shown to have no effect in RPC-108. It is possible both RPC-108 and RPC-108-1 absorb excess lighting. Exploration Log No. 1546-1 Subject CSD-1546-1 from now on. Designated CSD due to misbehavior around RPC Equipment one 125 watts LED lantern. Ten AA batteries for the LED lantern. One video streaming device. One decoy. And provisions and water for two days. CSD-1546-1 steps into RPC-108 and turns on the LED lantern. The lantern could only illuminate an area of three meters in front of the subject, despite the wattage. Testing, testing. Can you hear me, CSD-1546? Yeah. What the hell is this liquid on the floor? It is unknown. Please move forward through the tunnel. What's that noise? Can you hear it? Nothing can be heard in the recording. No noise is being picked up by our side. Could you describe what you're hearing? It's like water dripping or something. Understood. Please continue. CSD-1546-1 continues walking for an approximate of one kilometer 
before the described noise can be heard in the recording. After ten more minutes of walking, CSD-1546-1 stops. What is it? It's starting to get real cold in here. I'm having a bad feeling about this. They are just hallucinations. Before proceeding, please put your decoy on the wall. CSD-1546-1 complies, after which he continues walking for seven minutes. The subject is now two kilometers inside of RPC-108. It moved. What? It moved. The sound. I can hear it behind me now. Did anything besides that change in the environment, or was it just the sound? No, just that. Then please, continue. CSD-1546-1 walks for a few more seconds before stopping. Two eyes can be seen on the other side of the sewer, RPC-108-1, approximately ten meters away. Holy sh! What the hell is that? Do you see it? Yes, we can see it. Could you please approach it so we can get a better look? Nah, I ain't going there. Screw this. We already talked about this. Please cooperate and approach it. RPC-108-1 is harmless. CSD-1546-1 hesitates for a second before approaching RPC-108-1, now two meters away from its immediate vicinity. The anomaly is surrounded by deep darkness, making photographic archival impossible. RPC-108-1 jerks towards CSD-1546-1, causing the subject to enter into a state of fear and scream in panic. Holy sh! Get this thing away from me! CSD-1546-1 turns around and begins to run. As the subject turns back, the lantern stops illuminating the area and surroundings cease to be visible. RPC-108-1 seems to keep a distance of two meters from CSD-1546-1 at all times. CSD-1546-1 runs approximately five kilometers in absolute darkness despite the fact his expedition only continued for two kilometers inside RPC-108. It is apparently impossible to leave RPC-108 after entering. After extended physical expenditure, CSD-1546-1 collapses. Heavy breathing can be heard in the recording. However, further inspection of logs confirm that it does not originate from CSD-1546-1. End log. Exploration Log Number 1546-2 Subject CSD-1546-2 from now on Designated CSD due to misuse of RPC Against Protocol Equipment 1 130W LED flashlight 10 AA batteries Streaming device Provisions for one day were also provided CSD-1546-2 steps into RPC-108. The subject hesitates for a few seconds before turning the flashlight on and starting to walk. Hello? Hello? Testing, can you hear me? Yes, sir. This place sure is dark. What am I supposed to do? Just walk? Indeed. Keep walking until you see or hear anything odd. Sure. CSD-1546-2 walks for a kilometer before stopping. Do you hear that? There's some sort of water leak. No noise is picked up by the recording device. However, after 32 seconds, the noise can be faintly detected. Yes, I hear it. Where is it coming from? I can hear it coming from deeper into the tunnel. Very well. Please continue. CSD-1546-2 continues to walk for five kilometers without encountering RPC-108-1, proving that its position isn't fixed. The subject stops to have a drink before continuing forward. At no point does CSD-1546-2 encounter either CSD-1546-1's body nor the decoy. It sure is dark in here. When should I turn back? We're now just focused on the expedition as agreed upon. Alright. CSD-1546-2 walks for approximately 200 more meters before encountering RPC-108-1. 
The subject freezes in place, in response to RPC-108-1. What is that thing? Is it dangerous? Subject displays signs of intense fear, shaking the flashlight. It is completely docile. Please approach it so we can get a better look. CSD-1546-2 approaches RPC-108-1. No features could be seen on RPC-108-1 besides two eye-like features. As CSD-1546-2 approaches RPC-108-1, light levels decrease in his immediate vicinity. Upon attempting physical contact with RPC-108-1, all visual data is immediately lost. Can you hear me? Are you there? What's happening? What's going on? I can't see anything. What the hell? Help! Help me, someone! CSD-1546-2 begins to scream hysterically. The screaming continues for approximately 20 minutes, after which the subject collapses. 30 minutes later, it could be heard the subject standing up and starting to walk. There was no visual feed, and the static was strong, though the sound of footsteps could be heard for two hours after the subject's collapse, before a signal being lost completely. Definite cause of death remains unknown but later review of the footage suggests that CSD-1546-2 died of shock. It is unknown whether death was caused directly by RPC-108-1 or not. End log. Register Phenomena Code 014 Object Class Gamma Red Hazard Types Grouped Hazard Organic Hazard Regenerative Hazard Containment Protocols No RPC-014 instances have been contained thus far. Operation 014-01 is currently underway, with the goal of utilizing several MSTs to secure RPC-014, and nearby Dicerus bicornis longipes, western black rhinoceros populations. Human sightings of RPC-014 and or resulting fatalities are to be given appropriate cover stories. All witnesses are to be interviewed before being anesthetized. Description: RPC-014 designates several hundred thousand bipedal organisms most commonly found throughout South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. RPC-014 were first sighted on the coast of South Africa, 1968, following a particularly large thunderstorm. Their origin is as of yet unknown. RPC-014 has several traits resembling telluric species, but do not genetically trace back to a common ancestor with any known organisms. The most common characteristics of RPC-014 include Dark yellow glossy skin, resembling that of the Hippopotamus amphibious, because of identical tissue observed beneath the skin when injured. Instances may not have skin, but instead have exposed muscle. An overall structure of a bird, though instances lack wings, heads, and necks. A regenerative cartilage skeleton. The skeleton has no joints and is very flexible. A long tail, believed to provide bodily balance. A slit running down the chest, believed to lead directly to the stomach and or womb. Since ingested food is never disposed of via waste, it is believed to be completely dissolved during digestion. Webbed feet covered in bright pink tissue. Based on footprint samples, the feet are believed to excrete a sappy acidic pus an asexual reproductive system. Instances have been observed regurgitating RPC-014 fetuses from the slit on their chest, which reach maturity over the course of several hours. An indefinite lifespan. Little else is known of RPC-014's characteristics, due to research and containment difficulty. Despite the use of several containment methods, RPC-014 have proven unpredictable in terms of speed strength, and overall strategy used to avoid the authority. 
RPC-014 typically hunt in groups of 15 to 45, for instances of the Western Black Rhinoceros. One group may eat three to four daily. RPC-014 have not been seen hunting any other species or subspecies. Addendum 1 Below is a list displaying the progression of the RPC-014 population from 1970 to the present. If you would like to modify or add to this list, please contact Researcher Norwell. 1970 RPC-014 population has exceeded 1,000. Description had been revised. 1986 RPC-014 population has exceeded 10,000. 1994 RPC-014 population has exceeded 20,000. 2001 RPC-014 population has exceeded 50,000. Operation 014-01 has been initiated. 2005 RPC-014 population has exceeded 75,000. Western Black Rhinoceros population in Southern Africa is below 100, and preservation efforts in Northern Africa are increasing. 2006 RPC-014 population has exceeded 80,000. RPC-014 groups have been sighted in Northern Africa. Of the 100 Western Black Rhinoceroses captured in the last year, 94 have expired due to internal RPC-014 manifestations. 2008 RPC-014 population has exceeded 90,000. Termination of RPC-014 instances has been temporarily approved. Recent Revision Addendum 2 Addendum 2 The last instance of Western Black Rhinoceroses expired in Authority custody, 2012, rendering the subspecies extinct. Since 2009, the RPC-014 population number had steadily declined due to the rapidly decreasing food source, and by 2015, the population had dropped to an estimated 8,000. Several RPC-014 groups were observed hunting other rhinoceros subspecies, though they perished soon after by unknown means. In 2017, the RPC-014 population number held steady at an estimated 500, due to cannibalization of other living and dead instances. Since August 8, 2018, there have been no sightings of living RPC-014 instances. Research on the anatomy of dead RPC-014 instances is pending. Reclassification of neutralized is pending. Register Phenomena Code 032 Object Class Alpha Yellow Hazard Types Contact Hazard Animated Hazard Aggression Hazard Mind Control Hazard Containment Protocols RPC-032 is to be kept wound on a spool in a sealed containment bag inside of a locked safe. Any testing done on the object must be initiated in an airtight test chamber accessed via an airlock and observed through bulletproof glass with a ballistic rating of UL-752. Level 2 or higher. If any personnel is required to be in the test chamber during testing, they must wear a reinforced hazmat suit at all times. When testing is concluded, the testing chamber will be flooded with a lethal gas until all test subjects are rendered terminated. After the test subject is confirmed to be dead, an Authority Medical Specialist will enter the room to perform an autopsy on the subject and remove RPC-032 from the subject in the process. RPC-032 will then be re-secured inside of its safe. RPC-032 is a white thread that is made from rayon at 120.71 meters in length. If RPC-032 comes into contact with a living mammal, it will immediately puncture the skin and enter the body, taking the mammal as its host. While the threat is inside of a host, it will render the host unconscious and integrate itself into both the nervous and muscular systems, 
in order to take control of the host's movements. If the host is physically damaged in any way, RPC-032 will stitch them back together, repairing them with a high degree of speed and efficiency. This increases the host's durability against physical damage. However, it does not protect the host against other causes of death, such as suffocation, poison, or starvation. The threat itself is both highly durable and able to repair itself while it is in contact with a host. If the host dies, it will return to an inert state and can be removed from the host. Experiment Log 032-001 Supervisor Dr. M. Singh Subject Adult Female Brown Rat Rattus Norvegicus 0 seconds The subject came into contact with RPC-032 and became a host. 46 seconds The subject began crawling aimlessly and exhibiting muscle spasms. 2 minutes 7 seconds. The muscle spasms ended. 3 minutes 31 seconds. The subject began running in a circle counterclockwise. 5 minutes 12 seconds. The subject began observing the researchers through the glass, constantly changing the angle of its neck. 5 minutes 59 seconds. The subject's eyes began moving out of sync with each other. 7 minutes 7 seconds. A researcher entered a test chamber. 8 minutes 23 seconds. The researcher severed the subject's tail. 8 minutes 28 seconds. The subject's tail reattached itself. 10 minutes 34 seconds. The researcher cut the subject's torso in half, severing its lower body. 10 minutes 42 seconds. Subject's torso restored itself. Stitching in the skin is visible around the torso wound. 11 minutes 49 seconds. The subject began attempting to bite through a researcher's hazmat suit. 13 minutes 3 seconds. The researcher crushed the subject's head. 13 minutes 26 seconds. The subject's head restored itself. However, its neck is now attached at an angle 24 degrees to the right, and its left eyelid is stitched shut. 14 minutes 51 seconds. The subject chewed off its own front right leg. 15 minutes 2 seconds. The subject's leg reattached itself. 16 minutes 30 seconds. Testing ended. Subject terminated. Experiment Log 032-002 Supervisor Dr. M. Singh Subject Adult Male Domestic Pigeon Columba Livia Domestica Result No reaction on contact. RPC-032 remained inanimate. Experiment Log 032-003 Supervisor Dr. M. Singh Subject 1 Adult Male Brown Rat Rattus Norvegicus Subject 2 Adult Male Brown Rat Rattus Norvegicus Result 0 seconds Subject 2 came into contact with RPC-032 and became a host. 13 seconds Subject 2 began to run along the full perimeter of the room. Note, it's possible the host improved ease of movement. It's because the threat has remembered how to control a rat's body from the previous experiment. Dr. M. Singh 2 minutes 14 seconds Subject 2 stopped in place and observed the airlock door. Subject 2 began repeatedly tilting its head to the right. 4 minutes 19 seconds Subject 2 began observing Subject 1. 4 minutes 53 seconds. Subject 2 ran at Subject 1 and began an aggressive struggle. 4 minutes 59 seconds. Both subjects became stitched together at all points of contact. Both subjects are now considered to be a host. 5 minutes 40 seconds. Both subjects began to move together in unison, but were unable to crawl successfully. 12 minutes 20 seconds. Testing ended. Subjects terminated. Experiment Log 032-004 Supervisor Dr. A. Williams Subject 34-year-old male human CSD Personnel CSD-1749 Result 0 seconds The subject came into contact with RPC-032 and became a host. 26 seconds the subject stood up and began to examine its body. 
2 minutes 19 seconds. The subject bit off its right thumb, leaving it suspended by threads from RPC-032. 2 minutes 26 seconds. The subject's thumb reattached itself. 2 minutes 31 seconds. The subject began to observe the researchers through the glass, and began to imitate the posture and movements of Dr. L. Walker. 5 minutes 27 seconds. The subject attempted to vocalize. During the process, an increasing number of threads were seen in the mouth, presumably to manipulate the tongue and jaw. 7 minutes 55 seconds. The subject began to bang its fist and head against the glass very aggressively. 12 minutes 45 seconds. Testing ended. Subject terminated. Experiment Log 032-005 Supervisor, Dr. H. Robertson Subject, Adult Male Brown Rat, Rattus Norvegicus Result, Zero Seconds The subject came into contact with RPC-032 and became a host. This occurred while the subject was restrained to a table. 2 minutes 52 seconds The subject began to struggle against its restraints. 7 minutes 28 seconds The subject laid still. 16 minutes 13 seconds. The subject began to vocalize various noises common to that of a rat. 2 hours 31 minutes 49 seconds. The subject stopped struggling, only making minor movements. 2 hours 47 minutes 14 seconds. Stitches began to appear on several areas of the subject's skin. 76 hours 14 minutes 56 seconds. Subject confirmed dead due to starvation. Testing ended. Experiment Log 032-006 Supervisor Dr. M. Singh Subject Adult Female Deer Mouse Paramiscus Manicolatus Result 0 seconds The subject came into contact with RPC-032 and became a host. 1 minute 16 seconds A researcher partially submerged the subject in hydrofluoric acid. 1 minute 42 seconds. The subject began to struggle. 2 minutes 51 seconds. The subject was removed from the acid. The host is severely damaged by the acid. However, the exposed threat of RPC-032 appears undamaged. 4 minutes 10 seconds. The subject's body restored itself. However, the restored portion of the subject's flesh is highly deformed. The function of several muscles appear to have been replaced with the threat of RPC-032. 5 minutes 30 seconds. The researcher partially submerged the subject in hydrofluoric acid again. 7 minutes 11 seconds. Subject confirmed dead due to internal organ damage. Testing ended. Further experiment logs can be found in File 032-1A. Registered Phenomena Code 070 Object Class Omega Red Hazard Types Pending Review Containment Protocols The business owners of fast food establishments within the Burger King brand have been instructed to check their children's play areas for abnormal changes in internal structure. This is to be done at least twice a week. If anomalous behavior is found, it is to be reported to the Authority, and MST Victor-1 Tunnel Vision, is to be deployed to the location. They are to partially deconstruct the RPC-070 instance in order to neutralize the anomalous effect. Afterwards, it can then be reconstructed. In case of re-manifestation, staff should continue to check for structural changes even after a neutralization. Description: RPC-070 is a spatial anomaly affecting the fast food restaurant chain, Burger King, specifically establishments with a particular type of indoor play area. These play areas consist of a series of colorful tubes, slides, ladders, and other components, combined in a maze-like structure meant to serve as entertainment for customers' children. There is no discernible pattern as to when RPC-070 will appear. RPC-070 
only manifests once every several months or years. RPC-070 has never been documented, affecting more than a single establishment at once. After manifestation, an RPC-070 affected play area will undergo two distinct stages. The first stage lasts 25 to 30 days. It begins with the internal structure increasing in size vertically and horizontally. The exterior of the play area does not change in size or appearance. This increase in size manifests as a slow stretching and morphing of the plastic components within the structure. The creation of rooms and tunnels of varying shapes, sizes, and colors has been observed. The optic contains structures reminiscent of a children's jungle gym, such as monkey bars, rope swings, and net floors. After approximately ten days, the internal structure will have reached a size of roughly 60 cubic meters. Newly formed rooms and tunnels will have begun to take on irregular forms or housing anomalous contents. Some recorded examples include the following. A massive, elliptical room with 500 branching tunnels, each beginning with a circular opening. A pink tube traveling in one direction for 50 meters, without any intersections. A room with walls completely covered in spikes. The size of these spikes range from a few centimeters to half a meter. The spikes were made of dull plastic. An orange, circular tunnel, with a hemispherical window on one side. Through the window, an extremely large room was visible. In the corner, the figure of a humanoid entity was able to be seen. It was in a crouched position, its arms wrapped around its head. A rectangular purple tunnel, leading to the opening of what appeared to be an empty elevator shaft. The shaft traveled up and down, neither the top or bottom visible. An object was dropped in. After a few minutes, the object reappeared, falling from the upward part of the shaft. It continued falling, but did not reappear a second time. A turquoise, oval-shaped tunnel that began to shrink towards one end until it could no longer be traveled through, ending with a small hole. Looking through this hole, flashing lights of red, blue, and green were visible. Incoherent whispers became audible at close distances to the end of the tube. By the end of Stage 1, the structure will have reached a size of approximately 3 cubic kilometers. Most of the structure will be far enough from the entrances to be in complete darkness. The beginning of Stage 2 is marked by the appearance of RPC-070-A instances, which are quadrupedal humanoid entities with inverted spines and torsos. The creatures have human-like heads, rotated 180 degrees, and lacking any nasal organs. The entities emerge through small crevices in the tunnels. They have sharp claws, which allow them to obtain a firm grip on the walls. Because of this, 070A instances are extremely agile, able to travel long distances and around corners in the structure, much faster than a human could. 070A instances survive by consuming the children that enter RPC-070 affected play areas. In order to remain hidden from any onlooking parents or restaurant staff, the entities remain in areas of darkness. Children naturally avoid these dark areas often forcing 070A instances to hide behind corners and quickly capture passing targets, taking them away from any potential witnesses. After acquiring a child, an 070A instance will cover the child's mouth in order to muffle any screams until it has traveled deep enough into the structure as to not be heard by outsiders. Once far enough, the entity will consume the child. It first snaps the child's neck in order to paralyze it then begin to devour chunks of flesh. Once the skin and muscle tissue have been completely consumed, the entity will leave the carcass and return to capture a new child. 070A instances are able to manipulate the environment of the RPC-070 structure. They do this by pressing one hand flat against a surface. Said surface will then slowly change in shape over the course of several minutes. This ability is often used to create rooms to lure, trap, and or kill prey. Complex uses of this ability can take up to several hours. The following are some recorded examples of structures created through this manipulation. A blue slide that became steeper until it reached a vertical drop. 
This drop was at least 300 meters in height. Three corpses were found at the bottom. A trap door in the floor of a tunnel, with a small space below it. At 078 instance, would wait inside this space. Once a child was above, the entity would open the trap door and pull the child in. This method was effective enough to be feasible in areas relatively close to entrances. A small room with a crude drawing of a smiling person on the wall. There was a single doorway into the room, with a plastic cover that could be slid up and down over the door. And 078 instance would wait around the corner of the room until a child entered before sliding down the cover. An attempt to deconstruct an RPC-070 instance in order to study its anomalous behavior instantly neutralized the anomaly. The structure returned to its state prior to any anomalous expansion. Entities within the expanded portion of the structure, including 070A instances and several children, disappeared. It is unknown what happened to the entities and children involved. Addendum. On June 16, 2019, an RPC-070 test was approved, in which an RPC-070 affected play area was isolated and allowed to enter its second stage. Infrared cameras and audio recording devices were placed within the structure for remote surveillance. 50-070A instances manifested, designated A-01 through A-50, based on order of initial manifestation. It was found that without human children entering the structure, the 070A instances became cannibalistic. They began to viciously attack one another in order to obtain necessary sustenance. An event transcript is available below. Event Log 070.1 Date June 19, 2019 Experiment Lead Dr. Reichardt Forward All entrances to the structure were sealed prior to any 070A manifestations. All surveillance devices were unnoticed by the entities for the duration of the experiment. Begin Log The 50-070A instances have manifested and are pacing through the complex, not interacting with each other. The entities begin to appear agitated, as they cannot find any human prey within the structure. At this point, they gradually become more aggressive until the entities are attacking one another directly. A-35 approaches A-12 from behind. A-35 quickly leaps in front of A-12 before decapitating it and consuming the remaining corpse. This is the first death of the experiment. There were no other 070A instances within the area. The RPC-070 structure enters a chaotic state in which any direct interaction between 070A instances leads to the death of at least one of the involved entities. The remaining 33 are capable of avoiding direct interaction, making it increasingly rare for any entity to consume another through direct attack methods. Use of elaborate traps such as false floors and hidden doors become frequent. After four hours, 19 more entities are killed. The 14 remaining entities are as follows. A-01, A-03, a-06, A-15, A-17, A-22, A-26, A-35, A-36, A-37, A-42, A-44, A-47, A-50. A-22 is pacing through a long tunnel, as three 070A instances, A-1, A-15, A-42, appear from behind a corner, five meters ahead. The three entities had previously formed a cooperative hunting group and had killed four other 070A instances. A-22 quickly turns and runs from the group. A-22 quickly, a quickly makes a left turn as the other entities stumble through the narrow tunnel. A-22 leads them towards a large structure supported by four metal beams. A-22 had constructed this structure two hours prior. A-22 jumps into a square opening on the structure, crawling through a small tube. The three other 070A instances follow A-22 in, entering into a small room. A-22 is within a secondary room overseeing the other and activates a lever. The walls of the room containing the group begin to compress inward. They rub against the floor, creating an extremely sharp sound. 
the walls collide, crushing the three 070A instances. A-22 consumes their corpses over the next hour. During this time, and in another section of the complex, A-26 is atop a large pillar, surveying three intersecting tunnels made of transparent plastic. It has been atop the pillar for nearly the entirety of the experiment, only descending when the unsuspecting 070A instances are below. A-26 spots A-17 traveling through one of the tunnels. A-26 prepares to drop from the pillar, but A-17 suddenly stops traveling through the tunnel. A-26 ducks down, attempting not to be seen by A-17. After 20 seconds, A-17 slowly approaches the pillar. It then repeatedly lashes at the pillar until it collapses. A-26 dies on impact with the floor, and A-17 consumes the body. A-22 has now finished consuming the corpses of A-01, A-15, and A-42. A-22 leaves its structure and travels through the complex. After approximately 30 minutes, it finds a massive vertical drop in the floor of a tunnel. A-22 begins to construct a false floor, presumably planning to lure another 070A instance over the hole. As A-22 begins to create a weak panel to place over top the hole, a-36 emerges from a false wall. A-36 had previously constructed the vertical drop, waiting for 070A instances to attempt to build a trap with it. The walls of the drop were made with an extremely slippery material so that the entities could not grip them and climb out. A-36 lunges at A-22 from behind, but A-22 ducks, leading A-36 to land into the drop. A-36 screeches and claws violently at the walls. A thud is heard when A-36 hits the bottom. A-50 comes across the structure A-22 had built and sees A-47 scavenging through the bones of A-01, A-15, and A-42. A-47 is scrawny, having eaten very little over the experiment so far. A-50 is able to easily pin A-47 to the ground and snap its neck. A-50 rests within the structure as it consumes A-47. In the opposite side of the complex, A-17 stalks A-03 as it wanders through random intersections. Eventually, A-03 reaches the end of a long tunnel. A-03 turns around, and A-17 is waiting at the entrance to said tunnel. A-17 begins to walk into the tunnel, dragging its claws against the wall in an intimidating fashion. Just as A-17 is about to attack, A-03 a-06 appears from behind and slices A-17's legs, amputating both of them. A-06 has been silently following A-17 for several hours. A-06 begins to devour A-17, and A-03 attempts to escape. Without moving its head away from consuming flesh, A-06 slashes A-03 in the throat, causing blood to pour onto the floor. A-03 stumbles out from the tunnel but dies of blood loss shortly after. A-06 consumes both bodies and then leaves the location to create a trap elsewhere. After approximately 20 minutes of traveling, A-37 enters into a massive, torus-shaped tunnel. A partially consumed body, A-44, is visible 10 meters ahead. A-37 approaches the corpse and begins to consume its flesh before A-06 drops from a hatch in the ceiling. A-37 hesitates, allowing A-06 to quickly slice through A-37's back. A-06 begins to consume A-37 while it is still alive. A-37 drags his left hand and presses it against the ground. A crease begins to manifest, forming a square tile which begins to sink into the floor. After several seconds, A-37, A-06, and the partially consumed body fall into the hole eventually exiting to a lower section of the structure. A-22 is in this lower area, and witnesses the 070A instance's land, bursting on impact. A-22 collects the various chunks of bodily matter and carries them to the structure it had built previously. A-35 is visible, following A-22 from behind. At this point, the only living 070A instances are A-22, A-50, and A-35. A-22 approaches the structure and notices A-50 within it. 
A-22 quietly travels towards a small latch on the underside. It opens the latch before crawling inside. A-35 follows, and silently closes the latch from the inside, careful not to alert A-22 of its presence. As A-22 is about to raise the switch, which would activate the crushing machine and kill A-50, A-35 pushes A-22 over a ledge and into the pit with A-50. A-35 then lifts the switch. The walls of the pit begin to move inward. A-22 attempts to use the femur bone of A-42's carcass to jam the machine by shoving it into a crevice between the wall and the floor. The wall begins to stop moving, and A-22 appears relieved before A-50 attacks from behind, completely removing A-22's left leg. A-22 pulls the femur bone out of the wall, winding it back before hurling at A-50. The bone smashes through the side of A-50's head, obliterating its skull. A-50's body becomes limp and falls to the floor. A-35 deactivates the crushing machine. A-35 deactivates the crushing machine and jumps into the pit. A-35 grips A-22's remaining leg and pins A-22 against the wall. A-35 swings its arms, but A-22 swerves its head, avoiding the attack. A-22 presses its hand against the floor. The ground begins to melt. A-35 and A-22 fall through and land at the base. A-22 appears to have been knocked unconscious by the fall. A-35 regains its balance and drags A-22 towards one of the four metal supports. A-35 takes a piece of sharp metal debris and uses it to amputate A-22's right leg. A-22 begins to regain consciousness, but appears dazed and unaware. A-35 places the piece of metal against A-22's neck and begins to slowly slice the flesh. A-22 reflexively jolts backwards, smashing against the support beam. It buckles, destabilizing the structure. Pieces of plastic and a thick dust fill the area as the entire structure collapses onto A-22 and A-35. After 30 seconds, the rebel becomes still. Three hours following this, all entities within the structure are presumed dead, and the test is concluded. End log. Closing statement. The anomaly was neutralized by removing a sheet of plastic from one of the outside tubes. Shortly after, the affected restaurant was allowed to resume normal activity. Register Phenomena Code 147 Object Class Beta Yellow Hazard Types Auditory Hazard Sapient Hazard Containment Protocols RPC-147 itself is self-contained, with the exception of its RPC-147-1 instances. Due to their nature and sporadic manifestations, RPC-147-1 instances are currently unable to be contained. OL Site-147 has been established near the area circled around by RPC-147 and must be kept under observation by designated on-site personnel through the use of various remote-controlled drones equipped with standard recording devices. All husk events are to be appropriately recorded and archived as well as any minor changes in RPC-147's travel speeds. OL Site-147 is to be disguised as an active ecological research station and wildlife preserve. A 50km radius of protected waters is to be maintained around the site. These waters are to be routinely patrolled by Authority assets disguised as research personnel. Trespassers are to be interrogated, administered amnestics, and released into the nearby town of Description RPC-147 is a steam train, specifically a Union Pacific Railroad's 4000 Class 4884 articulated steam locomotive, commonly known as a big boy. The surface of RPC-147 is laden with what appears to be an isolated coral reef ecosystem, including an array of diverse marine life, such as Various crustaceans, 
most notably barnacles, mollusks, gastropods, and echinoderms. However, it is currently unknown how this ecosystem is supported, due to the little sunlight that reaches it. Additionally, RPC-147's chimney also seems to act as a pseudo-hydrothermal vent that supports its own ecosystem alongside the reef, incorporating chemosynthetic bacteria as well as Riftia pacatilla, giant tube worms. It is currently located off of the coast of Alaska, on the ocean floor of the Southern Sea, at a depth of approximately 1,205 meters. RPC-147's engine measures approximately 26 meters in length. RPC-147 is surmised to be operating on the ocean floor of the Arctic, without rails. It is not currently known what fuels RPC-147. However, it is hypothesized to be a result of an anomalous biofuel originating from the localized ecosystems upon it. Due to the inherent property of RPC-147, this specific attribute is difficult to thoroughly study. The speed at which RPC-147 travels underwater is approximately 330 km per hour, which is notably much faster than that of the average steam engine. The average speed being approximately 168.5 km per hour. Alongside the effects of prolonged exposure to the pressure of the ocean's depths, RPC-147 possesses extraordinary endurance. RPC-147 travels along a set path that roughly circles around the area on the ocean floor, known as the Tarak Igloo, by the local Inupiat peoples, later classified as SAA-08. This roughly translates to Shadow Home in a nictitude. Based off of folklore often told by local Inupiat tribes, this is supposedly the origin point of a race of anomalous entities. This area measured approximately 210 meters in length and 195 meters in width. RPC-147 appears to follow a strict procedure of performing six to eight revolutions before coming to a stop at the northernmost point of SAA-08, which is notably the point closest to land. When this occurs, a husk of it is undergone. Following this stop, RPC-147 will produce a sound, similar to that of those made by humpback whales. When this occurs, multiple, usually ten or eleven humanoids, cast in a black, unidentified substance bearing similar consistencies to ink will exit RPC-147 and dissipate soon afterwards. Multiple witnesses of entities possessing an appearance similar to these humanoids, hereby designated as instances of RPC-147-1, are reported in the nearby areas whenever a husk event occurs. The purposes of these presents are also unknown. Due to their nature, they are unable to be directly interacted with and will dissipate shortly after any attempts to contact them are made. It is notable that disappearances among the Inupiat peoples are not infrequent, and that these disappearances increase during a small period after a husk event. Despite this, the people currently residing in the nearby town have had no qualms about this, or at least have exhibited no signs of such. Further investigation towards their involvement with RPC-147 and instances of RPC-147-1 are ongoing. Addendum 147-01 Following the introduction of RPC-147 into Authority Archives, Authority Agent Penbrook was immediately sent to investigate the local populace, as well as record further information on RPC-147-1 instances. Agent Penbrook took up residence within the town's motel before conducting their investigation, as well as recording any discoveries they had made on a private laptop. Pembroke was then instructed to provide ongoing updates on their inquiries. These updates suddenly stopped three days into Pembroke's investigation, who shortly disappeared without forewarning of any actions they may have taken prior to their disappearance, leaving behind several belongings within their motel room, including their laptop, and a flash drive containing the aforementioned updates as well as various audio recordings and typed statements, 
that are assumed to have supposedly been reserved for ongoing updates. Below is the recovered information. U-01 November 1, 2000 628-56 This is Agent Pembroke. I have safely landed and have found residence in the town closest to the Anupiat settlement. I have already established my place. I should be ready to begin. I shall try to the best of my ability to maintain a clinical tone in my writings. All information found here shall be recorded in emergency drive should anything unexpected occur to me. I-01 Interviewer Agent Pembroke Interviewee Panna Black Anupiat native, fisherman. Forward. The local Anupiat tribes have shown to have extensive knowledge of RPC-147-1, but no currently proclaimed information regarding RPC-147 itself. Begin log. Okay, uh, Mr. Black was it? You can call me Panna. Alright, Panna. What do you know about RPC-147-1? Er. That is, the shadow people that come here every so often. I suppose I am to assume you are speaking about the Teriaksuk? Is that what your people call them? They are called by a few names, yes. What would you like to know about them? Well, for starters, why not tell me about Terak Igloo? Hmm. Well, it is a portal for the Teriaksuk to come through. Not much else is known other than that, I'm afraid. I see. What about the Teriaksuk themselves? Why do they come here? They seek others that would join them. What do you mean by join them? I don't know. The only people who know are the ones who decide to actually go with the Teriaksuk back to wherever they usually come from. I don't understand. The Teriaksuk are a mysterious folk. Apparently they're just like us. We just can't see them. You can't look at them, or else they'll disappear, so you have to look at them using a mirror or the like. Don't ask me why. I ain't a Shadow Man expert. There isn't anything else? There has to be more. I'm sorry to say, but I've given you all I've got. The only ones with the extensive knowledge you seek are the elders of my village, and they aren't too keen on speaking to people like you. People like me? Outsiders, you know. Preservation of tradition and all that. Okay, I have one last question for you. Have you ever encountered one yourself? I believe so, yes. At least I think I did. Did it say anything to you? It asked me if I wanted to join it on its train back home. I don't know why it wanted me to go with it on a train, but I politely declined. Disappeared as soon as it came. Well, alright, I think that's it. Thank you for your time, Mr. Black. Oh, no problem. I never quite understood tradition anyways. Also, one more thing. Yes? Avoid the shorelines. I heard the Teriaksuk like to meet and greet with unique travelers such as yourself over there. I'll keep that in mind. End log. U-02 November 1, 2000 1306-29 Shortly after my interview with Panna Black, and various short conversations with other non-native individuals. RPC-147-1 instances apparently do frequent the shorelines as previously found. However, people here don't so much as disappear, but will only go away. No ritual sacrifice or designations happen, as some very speculative researchers might like to think, but I'm still not quite sure what exactly goes on when something like that happens. Do they ever show up in greater numbers than one? Do they show themselves to more than one person at a time? More questions than answers at the moment. Shall maintain updates as I find more. November 2, 2000 1233 14 I found someone that could tell me more. Actually, one of the ever-elusive native elders. I had to do some rather mundane errands to do so. However, I can't exactly disclose what these were. I can assure you they aren't at all relevant to the investigation or RPC-147 in any way from what I can tell. The only way I was able to even find this particular individual was through active attempts to follow their tradition. 
I have to maintain that front to some extent. I-02 Interviewer Agent Pembroke Interviewee Tarkic A new Piat native Board Finding further disclosure of important details relevant to RPC-147 has been difficult. However, Tarkic has become willing to share information with the stipulation that I be without escort or recording devices. This interview was, however, conducted with audio recording, despite their insistence. Begin log. Thank you sincerely for allowing me to come here. I didn't think I'd ever get the chance. I assume you also know English? Of course I do. One must if they are to have good relations with their neighbors. Good, good. And you know why I'm here, yes? Word of curious outsiders spread fast, mister. I knew the moment you decided to talk with Panna. I apologize if what I did seemed intrusive, but I am doing this for a just cause. While I do not understand why you are so curious as to try and prod our people's heads for their thoughts, I will forgive your actions. What did you want to ask? About the Tariaksuk, of course. When did your people first encounter them? Hmm, yes. They have been around for a long time. Longer than I have been. Around the time my ancestors came to this place, we discovered them. Do you think they may have been here for even longer than that? I cannot say for certain. They appear to be as old as time itself. Why do they come here? What is their purpose? Their purpose here is simple. They long to show us their way of life. The Teriaksuk may be very shy creatures, but they are also very lonely. Not many of them exist. And so they take. Haven't you ever tried doing anything about it? Or them? My grandfather grew tired of the Teriaksuk, but he was scared of them. Frightened. It is widely known that the words are tempting, to say the least. That is the most of what little rebellion my people were willing to put up. Why so little resistance? Are they dangerous? The Teriaksuk are not a spiritual being like most would say. They are made up of the very same life that makes up you and me, flesh and blood, just expressed in a different way. Actually, there are many misconceptions about these people, but we have to maintain them for my people's safety. What does them being made of blood have to do with their purpose here? Well, not exactly blood, but something similar. Anyway, I cannot exactly say. Why? Because then they would know. What do you mean, they know? You may like to think something would simply not exist if you don't see it, but they do. They hang at the edges of your vision, like the dark spots you see when you squeeze your eyes shut for too long. So they're here with us? I suppose. They go where they please, listening. Um, I see. I apologize for cutting our conversation short, Mr. Pembroke but I have other matters to attend to at the moment. I hope this was satisfactory. Yes, yes it was. Good day to you, sir. Oh, and do avoid the shores, now that they know. I'm sure you've already been told that by now? Of course. End log. U-04 November 2nd, 2000 135630 The people here seem to live in silent contempt or the RPC-147-1 instances, but are too afraid to do anything, simply living with whatever they happen to do. I am at a loss as to exact specifics for meeting with an instance and their conditions. However, I assume these encounters are between one instance and one individual only. I fear that the only way to acquire any further information on RPC-147 would be through having an encounter with them myself. In preparation, I will perform a cautionary survey of areas highlighted by particularly high rates of disappearances. Further updates shall be sent in appropriate respects. Should assistance be required in the future, suitable action shall be taken as such. Note, it is at this point that Agent Pembroke ceases communication with the Authority. E-01 1730-01 Today is the 3rd of November. The time being 5.30 p.m. I have decided to take preemptive action 
and perform a closer inspection. I've activated the voice recorder function, in case anything major happens. I am not sure whether or not they'll appear, if I have it turned on, as previous tests have concluded that they don't. Maybe they will. It's just a gut feeling. If they don't, oh well. I'll narrate as much as I can, to adequately record the progressing events. 18-0109 Thirty minutes have passed. No anomalous activity has been as of yet detected. I am beginning to believe this exercise is pointless. 18-0632 I think… I think one of them is out there. I can't really see it. Even their silhouette is blurry as all hell. Sounds of car door opening and closing. Steps can be heard in the sand. It's… it's gone. But I swear I just heard… Damn it! I forgot my… where the hell is it? It's still in the car. It's gone for sure now. I thought I heard something, but… hmm. 181208 Nothing turned up to my obvious disappointment. After standing out by the beach for a few more minutes, no RPC-147-1 instance has shown up, like I had initially expected. I'm currently heading back to gather my bearings and make some kind of conclusion on the current state of events. 184056 Various sounds of steps and a door shutting. A moment of silence passes before Penbrook starts to talk again. Wh why are they here? There. There's more than one in my… I, I got back to my room. I can't see them, but there's black spots in my eyes. Black spots. Like the Anupiat Elder had said. They're here. Or at least I think they are. They're listening. They're… talking. The train. The one underwater. The snake under the azure sea. Why me? We know. They know. About what? I… I have to go. I can't record anymore. Now that they know. They know about us. The device at this point in the audio recording is to be assumed to have been left behind by Agent Pembroke. Addendum 147-02 As of October 3, 2000 Instances of RPC-147-1, departing from RPC-147, have increased substantially in numbers. Despite this, the disappearances within a nearby town are not relative to this random bolster in numbers. After the recovery of the documents made under Agent Penbrook, it is to be assumed to be a result of theirs and the authorities' sudden involvement near the anomaly. Request for reclassification of RPC-147 as a sapient hazard are currently ongoing. Register Phenomena Code 237 Object Class Alpha Red Hazard Types Aggression Animated Auditory Contact Mind Control Teleportation Sapient Containment Protocols RPC-237 is to be kept disassembled within its box in Storage Locker 9F on Site-473. Each of RPC-237 pieces are to be wrapped separately with cellophane wrapping. Each piece, whenever studied, must be studied individually and without contact to any other pieces of RPC-237. In the event RPC-237 begins reassembling, Site Security is to be notified immediately. An additional 348 instances of RPC-237 have been found. These instances have yet to exhibit any anomalous activity. The boxes of RPC-237 are to remain closed until further notice. In the event of an undocumented RPC-237 instance, personnel are advised to approach with extreme caution. Assembled instances versus disassembled instances of RPC-237 may have behavioral patterns regarding when it will attack and when it will become inanimate that deviate from prior observations. RPC-237 
It is a construction toy similar in design to the Bionicle toy line by the LEGO Company. When assembled, RPC-237 stands 37.8 cm in height, is colored black, and bears translucent dark orange eyes and ribcage, both of which reportedly glow faintly when present in the same room as sapient organisms. RPC-237 is constructed out of unidentified hybrid material that appears to be made of acrylic and steel, excluding the ribcage and eyes, which are an unidentifiable orange crystalline structure. RPC-237 is particularly notable for possessing two subulent horns, elongated claws, and extended front teeth. The cardboard box in which RPC-237 has been found within has a picture of RPC-237 on it. The name of the product's line, dubbed Biomechanical Warriors, as well as the words, Kyer Sefer the Lich. It also reads on the back, Warning, Choking Hazard, with an age warning prohibiting interaction by children three years of age or younger. The box retains the logo of Amazing Co., as well as numerous pictures of RPC-237 breathing green fire and fighting other creatures of similar design. RPC-237 possesses the innate ability to produce multiple limbs from its body, and has been observed breaking off and forcing these limbs down nearby victims' throats. These limbs will begin to tear at the tissue present within the victim's throat, resulting in asphyxiation as a result of blood blowing into the lungs. RPC-237 appears to target children primarily with this technique. RPC-237 method differs with adults, instead aggressively targeting tissue near the eyes, limbs, and throat. After the victim is rendered lifeless, RPC-237 will open its mouth and produce a mechanical resonance. Upon expiration of the subject from asphyxiation, bodily functions would continue once more after two minutes following the resonance produced by RPC-237. Revived subjects are designated RPC-237-1. RPC-237-1 instances, when revived, undergo cellular necrosis of the skin and an increase in hormonal cell production, coupled with high levels of aggression. Instances exhibit marginally increased physical strength, but are somewhat limited in basic neurological activity. These instances are also reported to produce a contagion that when physical contact is made by a subject, will inflict the same aforementioned effects. All RPC-237-1 instances attempt to protect RPC-237, as well as violently attack any sapient organism it encounters. All instances have been reported to be in possession of RPC-237. Reportedly, if contact between RPC-237 and RPC-237-1 is breached for long periods of time, RPC-237-1 will eventually expire. RPC-237 additionally appears to have teleportation capability. However, it renders the item inanimate for a long period of time, as it remains inactive for weeks at a time before becoming animate. As such, RPC-237 tends to teleport to certain locations and compounds where sapient life is few and far between, such as ventilation systems, sewage systems, etc. Research shows that it is impossible for RPC-237 to teleport when disassembled. Since an instance's disassembly, the ability has never been exhibited again. Recovery RPC-237 was recovered in a home in England on 23rd 2000. An embedded agent in the local police force encountered an instance of RPC-237-1 when responding to a report of a suspected homicide in progress, which took the form of a child who, despite fatal lacerations around the neck, was alive and attempted to attack an officer while holding RPC-237 in one hand. After successfully injuring the officer with the aforementioned item, the child fled the scene. Agent requested deployment of Mobile Specialized Team Hotel 1, Highlanders, initially believing the instance was an outbreak of RPC, which was granted. The instance was tracked to the child's property. After the failure of attempted reasoning, MST Hotel 1 
proceeded to deploy incendiary weaponry on the RPC-237-1 instance, successfully terminating it. After termination of the RPC-237-1, RPC-237 became animate and attempted to escape, attacking two Authority operatives and severely injuring them before suddenly becoming inanimate. The object was secured by MST Hotel 1. Parents of the child were found in the hallway of the house. The father, Mr. Dean, had had his arm severely mangled by what appears to be the child's teeth, and was missing his right thumb and his left index and ring finger, and was in an unconscious state due to blood trauma. Both injuries were barely cauterized with a torn tea towel by Mobile Specialized Team Hotel 1. Mr. Wife, Mrs. Marta, was in a much worse condition, suffering from massive blood loss as a result of several torn tendons. Mrs. expired from her injuries before medical attention was available, while Mr. recovered from his injuries and was interviewed immediately following general surgery was completed. See Addendum-1. Addendum-1 Mr. was interviewed by Dr. Montagru on 2000. The interview is attached below. Interviewed, Mr. Interviewer, Dr. Montagru. Board. An interview with the father of RPC 237's first recorded victim, conducted in hope of obtaining further information about RPC 237. Began log. Good evening, Mr. Thank you for agreeing to partake in this interview with us. How did you first obtain the item? Well, Marta and I bought the set for our son, Bryce, while we were walking down Avenue, and we bought it from a… a junkyard sale, if I'm not mistaken. The sale was at number 54. Marta told me that Bryce loved Bionicle sets, so we asked for a price. It was only 20 pounds, so we decided to grab it for him as a treat. All right. When did the object in question exhibit any anomalous properties? I was out for dinner with a couple of colleagues from work. Marta was at home looking at the Bryce. At this point, you had given the set to your son? Yes. I was called on my phone by Marta. She was screaming. She kept saying, the thing in the box, it was the thing in the box, over and over. I left the restaurant straight away and headed home because I was worried. So, did your wife say anything about when the creature came to life? Yes, she did. She said all Bryce and she did was build the bloody thing, and it just sprang to life. And where was your son at this stage? How would I have the faintest idea? Right. Sorry. What did you do when you came home? Well, the front door was wide open, and the house was, for the most part, normal. But when I got to Bryce's room, he was missing. Marta was in the living room, dialing 999. I asked her what was wrong and… and where Bryce was. She said Bryce was gone. Said that the toy was… was using him like a puppet. And when did your son arrive and attack you? I was trying to calm down Marta when Bryce came home. He was holding that bloody toy in his hand. His throat was… you could see his bloody collarbone. It was that bad. And then he… It attacked us. It went for Marta first. I tried to claw the fucker off, but I just couldn't do anything. I picked up the poker from the fireplace and smashed that thing with it, and it turned on me. It went for my arm. The last thing I saw was a group of gents stormed the place and let it rip on the thing. Then I woke up here. Hmm. Alright. Well, thank you, Mr. For your time. This information should help us greatly. Happy to help, Doctor. End log. Closing Statement Following the interview, Mr. exhibited symptoms of necrosis before expiring. Hours following expiration, Mr. became an RPC-237-1 instance and was terminated by site security. Mrs. body, having not exhibited any anomalous properties, was immediately cremated. Searches for the individual mentioned by Mr. are ongoing. Addendum 2 
the house where RPC-237 had been purchased from, was raided on 2000. The house owner reportedly abandoned the premise days before, but 23 instances of RPC-237 were found unopened and were transferred to Site-473. These 23 boxes have yet to exhibit any anomalous activity, but are to be monitored closely. Coordinates to an undisclosed location were found in the kitchen, written in lead pencil on a tax file form. Addendum 3 The coordinates found at the original RPC-237 seller's house led to an abandoned factory in Japan, and was raided by Mobile Specialized Team Romeo-7, suited gentlemen. Within the site, approximately 325 unopened boxes of RPC-237 were found within shipping crates. Two boxes were found open and missing their RPC-237 pieces. Blueprints were found on site on multiple benches, with unfinished figures in the process of being built. MST Romeo-7 secured the 325 boxes, blueprints, and unfinished figures, and transferred them to Site-473. The study of all items is ongoing. Addendum 4 Shipping label found with crates of RPC-237. Kyer Sefford the Lich, children's construction toy, a product of Amazing Co. 1,000 units. Incident Log 237-1 During study by Dr. One of the retrieved prototypes sprang to life and began to elicit a mechanical resonance similar to RPC-237's. The prototype then proceeded to display pyrokinetic capabilities as it began to spray Dr. with continuous flame. The prototype was destroyed by site agents via shotgun fire. All prototypes have been disassembled and stored away similar to RPC-237, and further research is to be approved by Site Director Azuki Masamoto. Dr. survived the incident and is currently recovering from injuries. Registered Phenomena Code 409 Object Class Alpha Yellow Hazard Types Info Hazard Extra Dimensional Hazard Unconfirmed Containment Protocols RPC 409 is to be stored within a secured bookcase equipped with a locking mechanism accessible only by staff with Level 3 clearance or higher. Any testing is to be approved by the head researcher and interviews are to be monitored by two ASF guards at all times, along with 409A1 and 409AB subjects being restrained as of interview number 20. Addendum C As of April 18, 2000, testing has been discontinued. Head Researcher Chow Description RPC-409 is a hard copy of the book The King in Yellow by author Robert E. Chambers. RPC-409 has been rewritten to contain a transcription of the supposedly fictional The King in Yellow play, featured in the original stories. The interpretation somewhat connects to the short excerpts featured in the original stories, and has the same anomalous effects mentioned in the short stories have been mirrored. However, new effects have also been noticed during testing alongside certain references from the stories being altered to accommodate certain anomalous effects. The original effects mentioned in the stories are somewhat present and include an extreme compulsion to read the entirety of Act 2. This is unchanged from the original source. This is preceded by drastic alterations in personality, occurring in 60% of all testing, designated as RPC-409-1A or gradual mental deterioration, occurring within the remaining 40%, designated as RPC-409-1B. These appear to be altered from the original concept somewhat, as the book has never been explained, doesn't appear to work this way in the stories. RPC-409-1A exhibit two randomized but permanent changes after reading 409. 
behavioral alterations, and personality alterations. Personality alterations are less concerning, with many 1A instances altering their personality to be more subdued. Only 30% of cases see an increase in aggressiveness, with greater than 6% of cases acting impulsively, meaning fatalities in most aggressive instances are uncommon. Behavioral alterations diagnosed include Schizophrenia three instances, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder six instances, Tourette's two instances, Bipolar II Disorder five instances, and six other unique alterations reported. The subject's altercation triggers randomly for a short period of time, and there appears to be no correlation between the reader's previous mental state and these diagnosed disorders. RPC-4091-B instances seem to encompass these mental disorders to the point of psychosis, with some 4091-A instances even converting into 4091-B instances in extreme circumstances. 4091-B instances can also trigger an RPC-409-2 manifestation by mentioning in any context the yellow sign. It is unclear at the time if 4091-B instances are compelled to say it by possibly 409-2, or if they say it by their own free will. Addendum A 4091-B instances now quote lines from the first act. Study is ongoing to understand exactly what caused this. RPC-409-2 is an unidentified humanoid entity that stalks 409-1B instances until they have vacated any surrounding public spaces before displacing them to an unconfirmed location. Attaching GPS devices to 1B instances have left inconclusive results, as the device stops working when the subject is displaced. According to 4091-B interviews during tests, 409-2 will regularly disguise as either a researcher or security personnel. 409-2 is only visible to 409-1-B instances, and will phase through objects if any attempt at physical contact is made. All subjects refuse to explicitly state what was written in Act 2 under any circumstances. 4091-A and 1B instances also seem to share a mass dream, where they visualize the city of Carcosa as interpreted in 409. Subjects have witnessed entities in this dream, collectively designated 409-3. They are mostly hostile, with only two entities described, a female entity with wings, only sighted once in explorations. The other entity has never been described other than being mentioned as he. Researchers have theorized it to be either and there have been five sightings of him as of December 8, 2000. All other 409-3 entities have been seen only when chasing subjects and appear as crowds. Addendum B There has been an unusual instance of 4091-A. These instances contain no long-term abnormalities other than the collective dream, and appear in less than 2% of cases. The first recorded instance was with subject and there has been cases since. 4091-2 is highly aggressive and persistent towards capturing these 4091-A instances. Any 4091-A instances should be immediately diagnosed and interviewed for any information pertaining to anything but the second act of 409. Researchers Diana and Werner. See Test No. 10. Discovery RPC-409 was found in the dormitory of Juan Curtis and the University of England. An anonymous call notified authority field agents, warning of, quote, a danger only fit for the authority to contain, unquote. RPC-409 was found on the desk, with Curtis missing from the premises. With the evidence recovered, field agents initially designated him a POI, but researchers later discovered he manifested 409-2, and POI status was revoked. Experiment Log Excerpts Test No. 2 
four subjects were made to read the entirety of Act 1, then were told to reenact it, each subject given a role from the play. CSD-5633 Camilla CSD-6221 Casilda CSD-3246 The Stranger CSD-1578 The Narrator Inner Monologue of the Stranger Head of Ministers CSD-0453 Ministers Citizens of Carcosa when appropriate Results The first act was performed with no anomalous effects present. A summary is present below of the first act. Researcher's Notes Well, at least that effect hasn't been altered, despite the circumstances of performing the story, instead of reading it. Now, however, comes the real test. Researcher Diana Summary of Act 1 The play starts with introducing the stranger, the protagonist, and situates him as a spy arriving from Aldebaran, his home city, to see the king in yellow. His inner monologue makes clear he hasn't been in Carcosa since he was an infant, and he is eager to meet the king for the first time, especially since his espionage turned the tide of the war between Aldebaran and Carcosa, their Carcosa's favor. He is only able to meet the Queen and Princess of Carcosa, Casilda and Camilla, who invite him to the King's masquerade party for his efforts, which has taken place in a few days. The following scenes consist of the stranger exploring Carcosa, waiting for the masquerade party. Many scenes revolve around the stranger meeting citizens of Carcosa, and him noticing events that make the city and its people appear stranger and stranger. Examples include dialogues such as, You should be thankful. It's his light that shines upon us, keeps us sane. He has my heart, my mind, and my body. Let him in and let him keep you safe. Ah, a foreigner. You know Carcosa is not a stranger to foreigners. We get them every now and again, through our many gateways. How are you finding Carcosa? The stranger realizes something is wrong with Carcosa and decides to investigate. He talks with the Queen and Princess about the King, and learns they only see him at masquerade parties, along with the rest of Carcosa. And with him mentioning the Lake of Halle outside of Carcosa, the two get upset and order him not to go there under any circumstances. When the stranger leaves, Casilda orders the head of the ministers to use his contacts to shadow him, to ensure he doesn't investigate any further. Despite the warning, he evades his stalkers and goes to the Lake of Halley. There is no scene explaining what happens there. Instead, it immediately goes to the final scene. The final scene starts with the stranger appearing at the masquerade and announcing his intention to Camilla and Casilda of unmasking the king and accusing him of a massive conspiracy during the party. Casilda agrees to help, soliloquizing on the tribulations of her king's actions and deeming this a punishment for his neglect. Camilla, however, is hesitant and runs out. It ends with the stranger and Casilda running through the plan as Camilla runs through the streets of Carcosa, calling out to the king, pleading for her life. Test number 3 The same subjects were given the same roles and were told to read and perform Act 2. Results, complete non-compliance from all subjects with four being converted into 409-1A instances and the other a 4091-B instance. Despite the threat of termination, all subjects refused to perform. When physically forced, all 409-1A instances converted into 4091-B instances and attempted to mutilate their limbs and rip out others' throats with their teeth or swallow their own tongues. While security attempted to stop the subjects, the isolated 4091-B instance was taken by 409-2. All remaining 1-B instances were self-terminated or otherwise mute. Test number 7. Subject with a 4091-B instance, acted mostly comatose, but under stress, was prone to hysteria. Subject mentioned the yellow sign, and 409-2 manifestation was imminent. All personnel were told to avoid the area and security were told to stay with the subject and shoot wherever the subject deems 409-2 is. 
Results. Subject went into hysteria, five minutes after mentioning the yellow sign, and test procedures were implemented. Subject became highly agitated and pointed at the door, leading security open fire at the door. Fire at the door lasted five seconds, which security then asked if 409-2 was terminated. Subject then responded that he was attempting to open the door, but security reported that they could hear nothing from the door. Onlooking researchers ordered the door to open. When security opened the door, the power cut out for five seconds. When they came back on, the security guards had converted into 409-1B instances, and the subject was gone. Researchers recall only hearing minuscule sounds during the power outage. Diana, this is only a warning, since your transferal here was recent. CSDs aren't as disposable here as they are in other sites and your current experiments have cost us more than every experiment combined this month. Make some headway. Prove that these sacrifices are worth something, and I'll negotiate with the site director to employ more CSDs to your efforts. Otherwise, we'll have to postpone testing until the new arrival of CSDs next month. Time's ticking. We need results. Head Researcher Chow Test Number 10 Subject was the second recorded abnormal 409-1A instance. Due to the aggressiveness of 409-2, subject was immediately interviewed on diagnosis as an abnormal 409-1A instance. The first question asked by the junior researcher interviewing was about the contents of Act 2. Results. As soon as the subject started talking, all personnel earshot became entranced. With the subject finishing his summary of Act 2, all listening personnel became either 1A or 1B instances, while 409-2 seemingly manifested and took the subject. All transcripts of this interview were incinerated, due to the possibility of an auditory hazard. Exploration Log Excerpts Forward Subjects were tasked in their dream state to explore and recount their findings. Breakthrough exploration are shown below. For a full list, see document Exploration Number 02 Subject with a 4091A instance with an aggravated personality shift and diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Ordered to check the nearest town and dream. Results Subject described the architecture of houses as dome like and perceived many large towers in the city. All houses subsequently entered were all empty despite signs of life. Dream concluded after 20 minutes perceived by the subject. Exploration Number 03 Subject with a 4091A instance with a calm personality shift and diagnosed with narcolepsy. Told to observe the landscape and notice any landmarks in an attempt to locate where Carcosa is situated. Results. Subject failed to describe the land around Carcosa, but managed to describe features in the sky. He recounted the sky as bright, despite it seemingly being night, with three moons and black stars in the sky. Subject also identified the constellations and Subject woke after approximately five minutes from entering the dream. Astrological tracking pinpointed at the would be where Carcosa is situated, but with observation of the planet, the city could not be seen. The head researcher proposed his theory, leading to a doubled effort in exploration of the interviews. Exploration Number 05 Subject with a 4091A instance with a nervous personality shift and was prone to bouts of kleptomania. Subjects was told to try and interact with any people or creatures of any do appear, and to take note of any differences in the landscape. Results. Subject described a day setting, with two suns. With this being the first dream state to be set in the day, subject was able to describe a lake, presumably the aforementioned Lake of Hali, as depicted in 409. The landscape surrounding Carcosa was depicted by the subject as a barren desert, with a mountain range behind the city. Despite nervousness, Subject tried to interact with a female entity with wings seen near the lake. She immediately flew into the city and hid. Subject tried to follow, 
but was scared away by an entity only described as large and titled He by the subject. Despite persuasion, subject refused to describe the entity in any other way than the moniker He. Subject woke up when he attempted to steal a small coin purse from the nearby house. Subject claimed as soon as he put it in his pocket, he woke up. Exploration number 6 Subject with a 4091A instance, with a reclusive personality shift, diagnosed with a form of PTSD, ordered to check important looking buildings. Results. After several minutes of agitation upon awakening, the subject recited their experience. The subject appeared in the market square, and began searching for important buildings. After a few minutes, he discovered a cathedral, and proceeded towards it. The subject knows the cathedral was built similar to the other buildings, with a dome-like structure and large towers, along with banners adorning a symbol now recognized as the yellow sign. See subject sketch here. Upon entering, he heard a conversation between two unseen people. The only clear words and phrases he could hear were, Our sign, summon, the blasphemous sinners, his puppets the few of us that remain, and rebirth. It was then the two conversing must have realized the subject was present, and they moved quickly towards the subject. Not knowing where they were, the subject ran out, and immediately heard more people pursuing him, and chased him through the city chanting, Reborn Carcosa. The subject attempted to reach the outskirts of the city, and was able to reach a path leading to the mountain range and he hid in the mountains until he woke up five minutes later. Interviews available to Level 3 only. Forward. The main purpose of these interviews were to see if the subjects could relate any further information on the book, its mechanisms, its author, or the location of 409-2 victims. Three choice interviews are listed below. To see the full list, read document Interview number 05 Subject CSD-1503 Subject with a 409-1A instance, and was quick to insult and antagonize overall. Excerpt from the end of the interview Look, give me something, or I swear to God I'll terminate you myself. Oh, five minutes with me, and you're already threatened to kill me. Very classy, you bitch. You think I fucking care at this point? <laughs> I fear nothing, motherfucker. If I could stop him, I can take you. Stop him? Who? 409-2? He only takes bodies, you idiot. Who the fuck you think I'm talking about? I'm thinking you're gonna tell me. Fat chance. Suck my dick. Researcher Diana describes in detail the termination method she'll enact. Cut due to extensive length. You're fucking psycho! You better start talking before this becomes a damn reality. I hope he takes you and punishes you like the others, you- Subject starts screaming and flailing on the floor. CSD-1503 refuses to stop until sedated. Researcher Diana was reprimanded for an orthodox interviewing methods, and it was later found that CSD-1503 converted into a 4091B instance and chewed his own tongue off. Interview number 20. Subject CSD-4058. Subject with a 4091B instance, and would continuously shriek unless sedated. For interviewing, the subject was partially sedated. The full interview is below. Hello, CSD-4058. I was hoping you'd answer some questions about the bad man. He's coming after me. And why is that? My mask's gone. I read the book and… poof, he stole my mask. Why is the bad man coming for you, if he's already stolen your mask? He's… that's not him. He doesn't like… when… CSD-4058 suddenly jolts her head up. No mask? No mask? Well, do I have a mask? GIVE IT TO ME! CSD-4058 lunged Researcher Diana, almost pinning her to the ground. ASF personnel moved Researcher Diana out of the interview room 
and terminate CSD-4058. Interview concluded. Borough 9 won't be instances after this incident. Now quote lines from the first act of RPC-409. No specific pattern or correlation has been established between the quotes used. The mention of masks also seemed to elevate, and subsequent interviews seemed to tie to masks symbolizing either a mental state or psyche. Cross-analyzation of Act 1 and its new theory is ongoing to decipher it further. Interview number 30 Subject CSD-0356 Subject with a 4091B instance was extremely paranoid and would murmur to himself, believing anyone talking to him was a voice in his mind. The interview was common until five minutes in. I can't let him. Not now. Not upon us, O King. What does the bad man look like again? Guards and scientists. He serves only for masks. Casilda, where is your mask? This is getting nowhere. What was in the book again? The Lake of Holly. We must reveal the truth. The sinners and maskless are sent. Where are they taken? To Casilda? The Carcosa? No. No. Casilda sinned and fell. Camilla pleaded for life. The sinners and maskless are to be saved by angels. <laughs> CSD-0356 holds his head in his hands and starts yelling. What's happening? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Even now my mantle is spreading through the gateway by the strength of Holly's captives. Shoot him! The unspeakable cannot be stopped. Even the Phantom hides and spreads lies of Carcosa to deceive you as he did her. ASF repeatedly shoot at CSD-0356. Subject continues talking through termination. Ah, the end of the coil beckons the vessel as his thoughts turn to dust, shamefully sustain the existence of this reality. CSD-0356 expires. We record that? Get the head researcher in here. His fucking theory is correct. Closing statement. Testing is now forbidden, and no one is allowed to read RPC-409, under the threat of termination. Head researcher Chow. Document 409-1 Forward. This is a transcript of a recording, found at the dormitory of Curtis. Field agents are still looking for the intended recipient of this recording. Okay. Yesterday, I mailed my piece to the Academy, hoping I would get in. Guess what? They mailed it back today! They said they ran tests and they think my piece is too dangerous. How the fuck did they even mail a letter back so quickly? Well, you note how Miss Academy, whatever, since the higher-ups of the Academy think my piece is too dangerous, I'm using it on myself. Sounds stupid, I know, but they claimed the delirium was permanent when I know I specifically made it temporary, and, oh, now I'm in the state of delirium. Uh, yeah, I hear whispers. Paranoia is definitely setting in. Soon, I'll fall asleep. And I'll see if I've got the dream manipulation right. The Academy should have waited until the testers fell asleep. Yeah, then they would have said they visited Carcosa, and they would have flipped their shit. I've got to say. I have no idea where the story came from. I was just writing, and it just flowed out. Like I was recounting history. Okay, I'm getting sleepy fast and I'm rambling. I'll leave this on so I can immediately record my findings, and hopefully I'll wake up before the Academy call the authorities. I'll email this to them, and then you. You did help after all. Twenty minutes pass before a sound is heard. Wow, holy shit, okay. Well, the dream manipulation is working better than I thought. I was able to conjure up a complete background for Carcosa, and even the Lake of Holly. I even got to talk to one of the characters, Camilla. She went on about the King's wrath, and the Phantom of Truth, and his betrayal of the King. Amazing stuff. And then she talked about the yellow sign, saying how it… Door is heard opening. Professor? How'd you… Wait, what's wrong? He requires an audience with you. You have information on the one known as the Phantom. What? I just… 
Wait. Oh shit, you're… If you resist, you'll regret his decision to keep you free. Come quietly, and you'll be rewarded. You stay the fuck away from me. Such a shame. I tried to be reasonable. Your fate will be decided by him. A brief struggle is heard, then silence. Tape continues in silence until three MST agents storm the room three hours later. Room clear! Why the fuck did we take this anonymous call so seriously? There is a recording device here. It's still on. Turn it off and get the investigators here. Also tell the others outside it's a false alarm. Jesus. How are we going to play off 50 armed men turning up at a university dormitory? I think we should be going with a bomb threat again. Let HQ know what's up, and about our cover story. Great. The MI-13 chaps will have a laugh about this. Recording stopped. Document 409-2 Forward. Letter found on the desktop of Curtis Addressed to him by a Christie from L'Academia de la Vera Art. Mr. It has come to our attention that you recently applied to the Academy of True Art, with your piece being, as you described, a monumental blurring of reality and fiction. We here at the Academy have reviewed your work and found it to be nothing as you have described in your passionate letter, with many of our testers being subjected to permanent change of character or insanity, and some even disappearing. We first thought your piece was seriously defective, but with many of our subjects mentioning your piece as the instigation for these changes, we believe it now to be intentional. You have two hours to reply to these accusations by the email address supplied below, or else we will have no choice but to surrender your location to the proper authorities. With regards, Christy, Curator of Literature Register Phenomena Code 505 Object Class Beta Yellow Hazard Types Sapient Hazard Ideological Hazard Transmutation Hazard Containment Protocols RPC-505 is to be contained in a standard humanoid chamber at Site-004 and be allowed access to various toys and games as a reward for good behavior. Due to the nature of RPC-505, all personnel must maintain a calm demeanor when interacting with it. Under no circumstances should RPC-505-1 be separated from RPC-505, unless by RPC-505's own will. All personnel must maintain the narrative that RPC-505-1 is sapient and alive while interacting with RPC-505. All instances of RPC-505-2 are to be contained within separate standard humanoid chambers at Site-004, away from RPC-505's own containment chamber. All instances of RPC-505-2 are allowed standard privileges provided continued positive cooperation. The instance that is designated RPC-505-2A is to be provided with a timetable detailing time periods at which they are authorized to spend with RPC-505. Said timetable must be scheduled and authorized by the head of RPC-505's research, at the beginning of every month. All interactions between RPC-505 and RPC-505-2A will be supervised by no less than one guard. RPC-505 is a Caucasian male of approximately six years of age and roughly 114 cm in height, formerly known as Scott Lewis. RPC-505 shows signs of generalized anxiety disorder, and has shown reluctance in socially interacting with other personnel. Generalized Anxiety Disorder GAD, is an anxiety disorder characterized by excessive, uncontrollable, and often irrational worry about events or activities. RPC-505-1 is a sock puppet that RPC-505 keeps on his left hand at most times. Referred to as Benny by RPC-505. Save for showering, 
as RPC-505 expresses fear that RPC-505-1 getting wet. Hence, it is kept in a box during this time. RPC-505-1 shows no anomalous traits, and is believed to be a coping mechanism created by RPC-505. RPC-505's anomalous effects occur whenever someone disagrees with RPC-505 that RPC-505-1 is not real in any way or form. A list of symptoms during the process has been documented below. If any person attempts to forcefully remove RPC-505-1 from RPC-505, they will immediately become an instance of RPC-505-2. Stage 1 Subjects will begin experiencing severe headaches and proceed to hear a voice talking to them. The voice is described by many instances as being high-pitched and at random moments going into long fits of rage over the subject's falsified view of RPC-505-1. Stage 2 After 72 hours, subjects will start suffering from the first physical change to their body, starting with their eyes. The eyes will begin to increase in size, causing damage to the ocular sockets and all organic material of the eye will be replaced with a white plastic shell containing a black plastic disc. Despite the severe damage to ocular function this would cause, all subjects retain their sense of sight and while they are affected by the pain that this would cause, they have not held RPC-505 or RPC-505-1 as being responsible for this, despite attempts to convince them otherwise. RPC-505 has never reacted to this with fear for unknown reasons. Stage 3 Subjects will apologize for any problems that they might have caused RPC-505 regarding their disbelief for RPC-505-1's existence, and will make attempts to become RPC-505's friend. However, subjects maintain their sense of self-preservation in this stage, and will not intentionally engage in self-harm. Stage 4 Subjects that are in proximity with RPC-505-1 will be able to hear RPC-505-1 talking to them, and will come under complete belief that RPC-505-1 is in fact a sapient entity that they can converse with. RPC-505-2A is an instance of RPC-505-2 that is RPC-505's mother. RPC-505-2A displays no different properties from other RPC-505-2 instances, but RPC-505 is shown to prefer being in their company in comparison to all other instances. Addendum 505-1 Discovery Log RPC-505 was discovered on February 1, 2019, during an investigation sweep of the police department in Southampton, England. According to the police report, a woman, Mary Lewis, designated POI-1817, was discovered by police officers as an RPC-505-2 instance. A search of Mary Lewis's home discovered RPC-505 to have been playing with RPC-505-1. RPC-505 was briefly taken into custody and was to be sent to foster care. However, during the process, a police officer had taken RPC-505-1 from RPC-505, which immediately turned them into an RPC-505-2 instance. An authority operative was immediately sent to retrieve RPC-505 and RPC-505-1, while RPC-505-2 and RPC-505-2A had already been placed in authority custody. Addendum 505-2 Interview Log Interviewed RPC-505 Interviewer Researcher Mark Woodford Forward Begin Log Hello, my name is Mark Woodford. Can you please tell us your name? Scott L -L Lewis. RPC-505 sniffles and looks down at the floor. I understand you might be scared, Scott. However, we just want to ask you a few questions. Can you do that for me? RPC-505 nods. Good. Now my first question. Can you tell us about your life at home? M well, I'm happy at home and… And my mom? Where's my mom? 
RPC-505 begins panicking. It's okay, Scott. She's doing fine right now. Can… can I see her? I'm afraid not right now. We need to run some tests, and then depending on what my supervisor says, we'll let you talk with her. RPC-505 begins to shed a few tears. Oh, okay. Good. Anyway, can you tell us about your… abilities? A abilities Have you seen the people with the, um, googly eyes? Y yeah Can you explain why they're like that? I… I don't know. But… but… When she was like that, she wasn't mean to me anymore. She was nice to me and wanted to play with me. Can you describe how she was mean to you? M mom would never let me eat much. She'd always hit me. Can you tell me why you would want to see her again if she was so mean to you? M well I started when I told her about my friend. Your friend? Y yeah, Benny. RPC-505 pulls up his left hand and smiles at RPC-505-1. So this is Benny. RPC-505 nods. Can you tell me about how you two met? M well, at first I didn't really have any friends. Everyone always laughed or avoided me, so I just wished for one friend. RPC-505 tears up. I'm sorry to hear. I promise to make sure that doesn't happen here. T thank you. So how did you meet Benny? B well, I was putting stuff together for someone to talk with, and then Benny started talking to me. What did Benny say to you? He asked me where he was, and I told him my house. I asked who he was, and he said that he didn't have a name. So I called him Benny, and he loved the name. Were you scared of him? I was at first, but then I spoke to him more and we became friends. I was happy to have my first best friend. Can you tell me what Benny is like? Benny is funny and nice to me. He always tells me about how he's feeling and I like to play different games with him. Can you tell me what games you two play? I usually just draw pictures and show them to him, because he doesn't have hands. That makes sense. What else do you do with Benny? I like to read him stories. Sometimes he makes some up for me so that I can sleep. Any stories in particular that he tells you? All of his stories are nice. Has Benny ever said anything weird to you? N no RPC-505 looks at RPC-505-1 confused. So how is Benny right now? What do you mean? He's sleeping. Right, sorry. I forgot. Are there any more questions? I I'm hungry. That will be all my questions for today. Thank you, Scott. If you go outside, there should be someone to escort you to the cafeteria. M when am I going home? I'm afraid you'll be living here from now on, Scott. However, I promise that your mum is here with you, and we'll make sure that you and Benny are looked after. Oh, okay then. End log. Addendum 505-3 Message from TOAS Psychology Department The Office of Analysis and Science From Senior Researcher Wilson It is of current belief by the Psychology Department and myself that after interviewing and testing RPC-505, that RPC-505-1 is not the cause for subjects transforming into RPC-505-2. I theorize that RPC-505 may be, in fact, be an unconscious reality bender. My reason for this being that after much and careful observation from our research team, we find little evidence to support that RPC-505-1 is, in fact, a belief-powered entity. First thing I found is that RPC-505-1 itself displays no sort of ACS level. When RPC-505 was, we quickly took RPC-505-1 and administered an AECR to it. Anderson Eckhart Coherency Reader is a machine capable of automatically producing a rough estimate for a coherency level of a given area. I understand that using the AECR machine was incredibly expensive and would have been better used on a different anomaly. However, the higher-ups were also curious as to whether or not RPC-505 might be an unconscious reality bender. 
I found out that RPC-505-1 had an exact ACS level of 4, meaning that it's at baseline level coherency, which is the same level for everything that is currently explainable by modern science. I do, however, believe that we should keep RPC-505 under the illusion that RPC-505-1 is real, as a way to control its powers. While a cognitive compliance harness would also be efficient, I believe that it's a more cost and reliable method to keep RPC-505 constantly in belief that RPC-505-1 is in fact alive. Addendum 505-4 Report Log Senior Researcher Wilson was found to have died during a containment breach that occurred. An autopsy was performed on Wilson's corpse, with evidence pointing towards a heart attack for witnessing RPC. A subsequent investigation revealed that the senior researcher had choked on an unknown plastic substance. Registered Phenomena Code 543 Object Class Alpha Purple Hazard Types Sapient Hazard Organic Hazard Aggression Hazard Grouped Hazard Extra-Dimensional Hazard Sensory Hazard Visual Hazard Containment Protocols All instances of RPC-543 currently in containment, a total of 1,000 individuals are preserved on movable shelves in the cold storage wing of OL Site 543, New Swabia Rift Defense Command Headquarters. Each instance of RPC-543 is connected to an electroencephalograph system, which measures their brain activity. A series of electrodes placed against the scalp, which measure electrical activity in the brain. The cold storage wing is monitored and maintained entirely by remote. In the event that direct physical repairs or maintenance is required in the facility, personnel are to be equipped with, at minimum, Type II antimimetic filtering equipment, as well as ear protection rated to 110 decibels. In the event that any instance of RPC-543 demonstrates the neurological signs of increased wakefulness or consciousness, the entire cold storage wing of OL Site-543 will be flooded with VX nerve agent at concentrations sufficient to kill all instances of the RPC-543. The OL site will then be placed on high alert, and Authority War Plan Overflow will be activated. The Authority Wide Readiness Plan, which assumes the sudden resumption of hostility with Haller Forces. For further information on Overflow and other comparable emergency Authority Wide protocols, contact your site or facility's Protection Division lead. Description. RPC-543 is the designation for 1,000 anomalous humanoids, colloquially identified as Howlers, captured by Authority military forces between January of 1939 and RPC-543 are anatomically comparable to human beings, with the exception of slight structural differences in the skeletal structure of the neck and upper torso, a heart with a single ventricle and greatly enlarged vocal cords. The jaw, tongue, and palate structure of RPC-543 allows them to produce a far greater range of vocalized frequencies and pure tones than humans, and they are naturally capable of simultaneously vocalizing overtones. All currently contained RPC-543 instances, as well as all instances killed in combat, have it anatomically female. Testing following their initial capture and partial containment revealed that RPC-543 instances, when conscious, exhibit greatly reduced sensitivity to pain and extremes of temperatures, as well as little need for sleep. RPC-543 are omnivorous, and have comparable dietary and hydration needs to humans. When conscious, RPC-543 instances are a visual cognito hazard which induces intense visual hallucinations and seizure-like symptoms in those exposed. While these effects are generally not lethal, severe secondary injuries such as broken bones and aspiration of saliva can result. 
unfiltered photographs or film of RPC-543 produce similar effects. It is unclear if digital recordings of RPC-543 produce cognitohazardous effects, as they cease to have an active anomalous visual component long before the invention of such technologies. Viewing RPC-543 through mirrors or lenses do not trigger harmful anomalous effects, though reports and photographs consistently indicate a mild visual hallucination in which the silhouette of RPC-543 appears unusually bright, unusually dark, or perspectively misaligned with the background. Eyewitness reports have described this effect as parts of RPC-543 appearing closer or further away than they actually are, and constantly seeming to shift in relative distance from the viewer. RPC-543 are sapient, and demonstrate levels of intelligence comparable to human beings, as well as a complex spoken and written language, which has not yet been successfully translated to any degree. Due to the unusual structure of RPC-543's vocal cords, their speech and vocalizations include tones which cause resonant vibration in the bone structure of the human ear. Prolonged exposure to rpc 543 speech causes dizziness and an intense roaring or rushing sensation in the ear, followed by hearing damage due to structural stress on the mechanical component of the ear. This effect combined with the large size of the RPC-543 mouth, is generally accepted as the origin of the name Howler. It remains unclear if RPC-543's anomalous effects are due to some form of as-yet undiscovered personal technology or natural biology. RPC-543 originate from the extra-dimensional space which exists on the outer side of the New Swabia Rift, a spatial anomaly located in the Schirmacher Oasis. Queen Maudland, Antarctica. As the area on the other side of the rift has an ACS value of 4.6, RPC-543's abilities have been theorized to be a natural extension of a more real reality overlapping with a less real one. A reality which makes our own feel dreamlike or surreal by comparison. For further details on RPC-543 anatomy, as well as a comparative analysis of different theories about RPC-543 technology and society. See Kleisman and Roche, a multidisciplinary study of RPC-543, 6th edition Authority Research Division Press, 2002. All instances of RPC-543 have been in a comatose state since 2.35 a.m. on 1940. They are non-responsive to any form of external stimuli, breathe at a rate of approximately 0.2 breaths per minute, exhibit a heart rate consistently lower than 8 beats per minute, and do not appear to require solid or liquid sustenance in any form. The anatomical origins of this biological homeostasis are unclear, as RPC-543 lack any biological or anatomical mechanism for hibernation. In light of the prolonged period of time during which they were studied while conscious during the Austral War, and the current material cost of containing RPC-543, all testing on individual instances is currently suspended. Addendum: Recovered RPC-543 New Technology RPC-543 instances make substantial use of an as yet poorly understood form of highly applied memetics designated New Technology. This paradigm of technological development appears to revolve around the use of abstract concepts which, when processed by the mind, generate persistent physical changes in the local structure of new craft, persistent violation of defies reverse engineering, with the exception of 1982, considerable casualties among test personnel. Permanent access to Dreamland. This information is classified level 4B by order of authority central intelligence. Permission for easier kit to our application of new technologies is granted on a case by case basis by unanimous agreement from the global directorate. Unlawful pursuit of such ventures is ground for permanent dismissal and amnestization. 
Original RPC-543 Documentation Database Entry Introduction The following is a digitized transcript of the original containment documentation for RPC-543, created on April 27, 1939. The formatting has been preserved to be consistent with RPC archival documents of this period. In the interest of completeness, original punch card database system codes have been preserved. Where useful, contextual explanations have been included. Registered Phenomena Code 543 Informal Designate Howlers Object Risk Red Containment Degree Severe Equivalent to the modern Gamma Rating Primary Hazard Vision-induced Injury The study of memetics was still in its infancy in this period, and there was little distinction between memetic and info hazardous effects. Secondary Hazard Sapient Aggressive The hazard system at this time further subclassified sapients by the degree of physical and psychological resistance to containment offered by the anomaly. Tertiary Hazard Spatial Extracontextual An extracontextual anomaly here referred to a spatial or dimensional hazard originating from alternate or pocket universes. Number Contained 178 Reporting Personnel Dr. Joseph Hafner Containment Systems The team has had great success containing RPC-543 individuals, captured by security teams, in any standard man-proof holding chamber. We have been using binoculars, shaving mirrors, telescopes, even prisms, anything with a refractive or reflective effect, to avoid having to look at them directly. The guard staff have begun soundproofing the containment cells with whatever spare cloth or insulation they can find. In a pinch, cotton balls in the ears work passively. Unfortunately, a few of the guard and research personnel involved in the earliest containment, especially the Germans, got a full dose of whatever visual anomaly the 543s are putting out. We had to put down a few who would not stop seizing, poor devils. Standard prisoner rations suffice to feed RPC-543. We have been keeping their water and food supplies low. It keeps them docile, makes them less likely to fight back when we need them for testing. We have enough instances of containment already that we have instituted a shoot-on-sight policy for any found attempting to escape. Regrettably, it does not seem to have any instructive effect on those still left alive. Pacification Systems RPC-543 can be killed by any means which would fatally injure a man. That being said, the difficulty of observing them directly makes aimed gunfire or physical strikes ineffective. A combination of incapacitating gas, they seem just as vulnerable to nitrogen inhalation as we are, followed by flamethrowers when they are unconscious and their resistance is down, has proven successful. Explosives generally work well but present obvious practical difficulties. Our applied Reotronics team has had promising results with atomic radiation. A form of primitive particle acceleration technology, then under testing by the Authority as a gamma-ray-based directed energy weapon. We will continue to provide updates as the situation develops. Pacification Note All of the RPC-543 entities currently in containment are biologically female. Any inappropriate or unnecessary social behavior on the part of staff will be punished according to standard authority rules of conduct. Research staff appreciate that none of us has had much contact with a woman since the start of the expedition, but my god, they're not human. They attacked us first, gentlemen. They are not our friends. Object Description for a detailed description of the physiological and anatomical characteristics of RPC-543, see the attached medical log. We have conducted thorough observational analysis, as thorough as is possible given their visual effects. Vivisection and dissection have yielded more concrete results. Whatever visual effects these things generate come from the outer surface of their skin. Howler intestines are just as non-anomalous as ours. We have yet to overcome their extreme resistance to pain. 
It is unclear if the source is psychological or physiological. They starve and dehydrate at comparable rates to human beings, and they can be asphyxiated, at the very least. They also have a notable vulnerability to atomic radiation. Gamma radiation that causes no noticeable harm to a man will induce the equivalent of third-degree burns in RPC-543. Behavior Characteristics RPC-543 are human in their behavior. When the Germans first opened the rift, they massacred the entire research team, as far as we can tell, but did not touch the Funk Mesquerit they had installed. Literally radio measuring device. An experimental radar system which the members of the new Swabia expedition used to open the rift. They can operate in groups, delegate tasks, and have a solid understanding of battlefield tactics. That much the security team can confirm. We have theorized that they do not understand the concept of physical technology. They will coordinate to get within range of a machine gun nest, then kill the gunner with their bare hands but leave the gun and the ammunition intact. I do not believe they are capable of fear. They must have some kind of society. There is an obvious degree of social hierarchy among the individuals captured. We have had no success understanding them, or getting to understand us. They do not wear clothing, and seem confused by simple and elementary items like cutlery, doorknobs, even furniture. At first we provided their cells with beds and chairs, but they were totally unaware how to use them. Some of them have obviously picked up the habit of using chairs after observing our test personnel. They can learn, at the very least. They have, universally, been hostile to us. We have tried communication via every language spoken by the team, as well as a variety of pictograms, sign languages, and even basic miming, to no avail. They do not go armed, but they have inflicted significant losses on the security team. And as far as we can tell, more are coming out of the rift every day. This does not feel like we have kicked the nest of some extra-spatial animal. This is organized and violent resistance. This might, God help us, be war. Addendum Exploration of New Swabia Rift During a lull in the fighting on the 26th of February, one of the security teams walked down to the bottom of the oasis lake bed. The water drained out of it when the rift was opened, and tried to cross over to whatever extra contextual space is on the other side. From what the eyewitnesses have told us, they were only over there for 10, maybe 15 seconds. Attached below is a transcript excerpted from an interview with Hoptimann Gerald Fuchs, who saw the men return. Note that Herr Fuchs is a veteran of the Great War has seen extended combat with the German Freikorps, and is one of the few surviving members of the German team who has not yet succumbed to the effects of RPC-543. They left the hole at the bottom of the lake bed at maybe 4, 5 in the morning. At first, all we saw was blinding light and color, and then… Tears. Yes, the singing of… Perfect beauty and light and… Truth does exist. The light. And out of… We… Into dust. And then, at this, I will never forget, they all… You have to let us go. Dreamland. Memorandum from the Global Directorate on RPC-543 Operations. The Austral War is long over. If you've opened this file seeking some insight into the Howlers, into who they were, or why they fought, you will not find it here. All relevant pieces of documentation on the Austral War, the various ethical and unethical studies of Howler behavior, anatomy, and society are declassified, and in various authority libraries. There is no great conclusion to be drawn from the war, or from our enemies, or even from their technologies. Move on. For the sake of your soul, if nothing else, do not dream of Dreamland, please. A dream of victory on the barren ice. A dream in which you conquered us. A dream of inhumanity and sorrow. A dream of bile and vivisection. A dream of war and conquest. A dream you try to justify. A dream you try to forget. 
Your dream, not ours. We will wake up, and the truth of our kingdom will devour the fantasy you call existence. Register Phenomena Code 555 Object Class Alpha White Hazard Types Not Applicable Containment Protocols OL Site 555 has been established at RPC 555 location and is composed of two buildings. OL Site 555 A constructed at RPC 555's entrance to conceal it under the guise of a visitor center. Maintained in tandem with the Americas National Parks Nonprofit. OL Site 555B A repurposed warehouse within Middlesboro, used for storage and testing of RPC 555 2. All objects and organisms exiting RPC 555 should be cleaned of any possible RPC 555 2 contamination. In the event that samples of RPC 555 2 are discovered elsewhere, Personnel should follow standard procedure for the collection and transport of anomalous liquids, and all retrieved materials should be sent to OL Site 555B for study. Description: RPC 555 is a cave underneath Cumberland Gap National Historical Park, a park within the United States, located on the borders of Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. It consists of a single chamber approximately 3 km long, 2 km wide, and 1.5 km tall. Actual height varies, as the floor of RPC-555 gradually slopes downwards towards the cave center. RPC-555 is accessible through a vertical tunnel connected to the ceiling of RPC-555 southwest corner. This tunnel is 10 meters in diameter and 800 meters high and possesses smooth walls indicating it was artificially constructed. Embedded below the entrance to RPC-555 is RPC-555-1, a cylindrical object, 11.5 meters in diameter, with an exposed height of 28 meters. RPC-555-1 is composed primarily of chromium and ruthenium, along with trace amounts of cesium and phosphorus. All attempts to determine the object's full size have failed, as RPC-555-1 extends deeper than any currently measurable distance. RPC-555-1 does not display any other anomalous properties. RPC-555 contains a deciduous forest typical of the surrounding area, with fauna consisting primarily of deer and various rodents. Animals within RPC-555 exist in a mix of living, dead, and reanimated states. While it was originally unknown how such an environment could survive in the absence of light, water, or soil, further examination led to the discovery of RPC-555-2. RPC-555-2 is a dark red liquid present on the walls of RPC-555. It is not excreted from any specific source. Rather, it continuously manifests on the walls of RPC-555, as well as around RPC-555-1, and flows downward, pulling into a lake at the cave center. RPC-555-2 is currently composed from the blood of various animals, including, but not limited to, Bose Taurus, domestic cattle, Ursus Arctos, the brown bear, and Crotalus horridus. The Timber Rattlesnake. RPC-555-2 functions as the primary source of energy and nutrition for the inhabitants of RPC-555. It is capable of sustaining life independently and indefinitely, and organisms that consume RPC-555-2 will grow at rates of up to 20% faster than those that do not. RPC-555-2 is also capable of accelerating the closure of small wounds though it cannot restore lost mass in the case of larger injuries. The most notable property of RPC-555-2 is its effect on deceased animals. 
Animals that have previously ingested RPC-555-2, hence force RPC-555-A, will continue to move after brain death. While not hostile, RPC-555-A are devoid of any brain function, and will wander aimlessly until their body decays or is damaged to a point where movement is no longer possible. This effect also occurs if RPC-555-2 is applied after death provide the affected mass contains a means of locomotion. Discovery. RPC-555 was brought to the authorities' attention following a livestream from YouTube user documenting the exploration of a bottomless pit within Cumberland Gap National Park. Real name. While descending, the streamer loses its grip on the tunnel wall and falls meters into RPC-555 dying upon impact with RPC-555-1. His camera continues to record, and captures footage of reanimating, due to the effects of RPC-555-2. He then crawls deeper into RPC-555, leaving his equipment behind. An authority disinformation campaign was enacted shortly after involving the release of multiple videos debunking the livestream. While Equipment has been recovered. His body has yet to be located. Since the discovery of RPC-555, additional samples of RPC-555-2 have been discovered at various locations around the world, all completely enclosed at depths between 450 meters and kilometers below the surface. However, RPC-555 remains the only location where a continuous stream of RPC-555-2, an instance of RPC-555-1, and a developed ecosystem have been found. Register Phenomena Code 906 Object Class Gamma Purple Hazard Types Aggression Hazard Animated Hazard Aquatic Hazard Contact Hazard Transmutation Hazard Sentient Hazard Extreme Temperature Hazard Titanic Hazard Containment Protocols RPC-906 must be under constant surveillance by the Authority Nautical Fleet, hereafter referred to as ANF. The totality of the Authority's maritime vessels. RPC-906 is currently located on an island north of Svalbard, where it is to be monitored by four ANF submarines. At least twenty animals of varying species are to be placed on the island on a weekly basis in order to satisfy RPC-906 and prevent it from attempting to breach containment. In the event of a containment breach, ANF submariners are to pursue and maintain a visual on RPC-906, and are permitted to use 500mm high-explosive torpedoes, should the need arise. If RPC-906 disappears from its current location, it must be located as soon as possible and placed under surveillance. RPC-906 is a vaguely humanoid entity, composed of approximately 118,705 kg of snow. This figure is debatable, as it was derived from the approximate value of RPC-906 and the density of settled snow, though some researchers theorize that RPC-906's density could be as high as that of wind-packed snow or even fern. Due to this, it seems to thrive at temperatures below negative 0.6 degrees Celsius, though it shows anomalous resistance to heat. The anomaly is amphibious and despite being composed entirely of snow, does not float on water. Instead, it walks along the seafloor. RPC-906 is an ambush predator, able to change its shape in the lure tactic. Though it does not require sustenance, RPC-906 actively seeks out animals to attack. RPC-906 possesses qualities similar to brinicles in that it flash-freezes anything that makes physical contact with it. Consequently, most victims of RPC-906 expire due to hypothermia. 
All attempts to contain RPC-906 within an enclosed space have failed, as it actively and violently escapes such containment efforts. So far, deaths, including human casualties, have been attributed to RPC-906. Addendum Discovery Forward The following is a series of excerpts from audio logs on a digital recorder discovered in Yorkshire, Russia. Begin Log December 20, 19 I came home today to see a crowd of people by the harbor. Three miners had died overnight, but they were still standing, frozen in solid ice. They were looking upwards, and their faces were contorted in expressions of shock and horror. I wonder what they saw that was so terrible. End Log Begin Log December 21, 19 God save us. Six more men have succumbed to the flash freeze phenomenon, as they call it. They were all pointing up, like they saw a plane. My neighbor thinks the Americans have developed some sort of ice bomb that freezes you in your tracks when it detonates. Despite it being the best theory that's come up so far, it still seems ridiculous. Why would they make something like that when they already have atom bombs? And if they didn't make it, why would they drop it here? Testing, perhaps? All I know is that I haven't heard any plane engines lately. End Log Begin Log December 22, 19 Twelve people died today. Twelve. And they all died just like the nine who died yesterday and the day before. This is getting out of hand. Whoever or whatever is doing this, it seems to be growing in strength. So is the civil unrest here. It's mass hysteria. People are protesting against the mayor, fighting in the streets, and claiming that they saw a moving hill just east of here. When I get the money, I'm moving away from here. End Log Begin Log December 23, 19 There was a riot today. My friend Dmitri, along with Igor, Oleg, Yevgeny, and a few others, they took guns and clubs and started attacking the police. Needless to say, the rioters were all either arrested or killed. It's sad how we have degenerated since this whole thing began. The whole damn town is either frozen solid or a victim to the madness. End log. Begin Log December 24, 19 All of them are dead. The whole town is dead, covered in ice. I only survived because I was doing business out of town. I wish I could have taken my wife and son with me too. My god, why must I be terrorized? End Log Begin Log December 25, 19 You'd think, on its birth week, Jesus would show mercy on the people of Yorkshire. No, not so. He has shown us hell, and it is pure ice. Closing Statement The individual who recorded these audio logs contacted the Russian government which in turn contacted the Authority. When MST Delta-25 Sub-Zero arrived at Yorkshire, they managed to destroy the moving hill mentioned in the audio logs. The anomaly, now RPC-906, was originally classified as neutralized until a similar phenomenon to the Yorkshire incident happened in Nordislandet, Norway. RPC-906 was diverted from the civilian population by the ANF and led to the island upon which it is currently contained. Addendum 2018 Researchers have reported a 5% increase in RPC-906's size since it was discovered in 19. If this trend is consistent and the growth continues, the Authority must either revise containment protocols or prepare for an apocalyptic scenario within the next years. Reclassification to Gamma Black is currently pending. Registered Phenomena Code 909 Object Class Gamma Yellow Hazard Types Aggression Psychotronic Sapient Extradimensional Teleportation Extraterrestrial 
Immeasurable Containment Protocols RPC-909 is to be kept in a 10m by 10m by 10m reinforced ballistic glass containment unit, at sight. Subject is to be monitored at all times by a 24-hour router of no less than 4 personnel of minimum level 2 clearance. All cameras are to be inspected daily, and maintained accordingly. In the case of a containment breach, or if RPC-909 becomes agitated, Class C sedative gas is to be released via the containment unit's ventilation system. Any human child found in RPC-909's containment chamber is to be recovered immediately, if possible. Missing persons location protocols are then to be initiated. Level 3 research and medical staff are permitted to enter RPC-909's containment unit while RPC-909 is unconscious to perform routine physical checks. Any documents pertaining to medical operations to be performed on RPC-909 should be cleared by Dr. before procedures are carried out. Upon Dr. request, the containment cell has been issued a surplus of preschool educational toys in hopes of garnering attempts of interaction and or basic learning from RPC-909 given its childlike disposition, as well as to occupy RPC-909 in hopes of reducing the risk of an abduction incident. RPC-909 is a large, vaguely octopoid lifeform measuring 4.2 meters in height and 6,000 kg in body mass. Its origin is unknown, but is theorized to be extraterrestrial as RPC-909's biochemistry appears to be methane-based. Tissue samples of RPC-909 contains a chemical structure similar to heptane, a compound used to make rubber cement. RPC-909 is capable of levitation and hovers 2 meters above ground and is able to move through the air at observed maximum speeds of 8.9 meters per second. The anatomy of RPC-909 consists of a large head, measuring roughly 2 meters in diameter, with visible red optic glands behind the eye sockets. On each side of RPC-909's torso are three elastic tubular tentacles, each ending in a five-digit humanoid hand. The front of RPC-909's rib thorax opens up to an exposed chest cavity that appears to absorb excess light of any source, appearing as a void within RPC-909's chest. Only a faint red glow within the center of the chest cavity has been observed. The mouth of RPC-909 appears to resemble a beak, with mandible-like appendages that protrude from the lower jaw, and two distinctly human eyes of a crimson coloration. Two symmetrical translucent tubes protrude from the sides of RPC-909's lower spine and connect to the front of the subject's lower abdominal region. The purpose of these tubes is unknown, but appear to be biological in nature, and thus must serve some biological function. One hypothesis from Dr. is that the tubes, being of a slight reddish saturation, could be part of the circulatory system or filtration system that provides RPC-909 a means of sustenance, be it nutritional or respiratory. The bottom of RPC-909's torso has five appendages, similar to crab legs, in a quadratic arrangement below the abdomen, with the fifth longest leg within the center portion. However, these legs appear to serve no ulterior purpose, as RPC-909 does not appear to utilize them, though they often gyrate during levitation. It has been theorized that its levitation capabilities are somehow attributed to its legs. The biological research of RPC-909 is still ongoing. Psychologically, RPC-909 appears to act similarly to a human child around the age of three years. While RPC-909, unable to communicate verbally, RPC-909 is capable of understanding basic gestures and words without response, showing signs of intelligence but little engagement in communication. RPC-909 is also prone to violent temper tantrums, in which it will vocalize loudly and lash out with its arms 
either against the walls of his containment unit or towards nearby personnel. Researchers noted his vocalizations as similar to a human infant. These bouts of rage are usually triggered seemingly at random, or after RPC-909 shows obvious signs of becoming irritable. One anomalous property of RPC-909 is its spatial displacement of its own arms. When not directly observed, the hands of RPC-909 seem to teleport from containment into an alternate location. Subject has been shown conducting this anomalous behavior from behind solid walls, within crevices, and even behind its own back. Research shows that RPC-909's arm would manifest in a location around the world that contains large gatherings of children at play, most commonly either an outdoor or indoor play area. Recovered CCTV footage has shown children being abducted by RPC-909's arms through slides, ball pits, and sand pits before being violently dragged out of sight. The child would then reappear in RPC-909's containment chamber. During these breaches by RPC-909, the sighted children have been identified, and collating with the aforementioned footage and missing person reports provided substantial evidence that these are indeed the same children that have been abducted. After having abducted the child, RPC-909 will immediately place the child's subject within its open chest cavity. The child, for all intent, no longer exists within the baseline reality. While initially believed that the child was consumed by RPC-909, the incident during August 5th led to a different conclusion for those taken by RPC-909. On August 5th, maintenance worker Grant Ellis, assigned to clean RPC-909's containment unit, was assaulted and supposedly consumed by RPC-909 after awaking it from a nap. After a three-day period, Grant Ellis was returned through the chest cavity, fully intact and alive, but suffering moderate psychological damage comparable to those having been in confined spaces for a prolonged amount of time. This incident led to the conclusion that the children that RPC-909 has abducted are being stored in some form of alternate space or dimension found within its chest cavity. After this incident, Grant Ellis was debriefed and interviewed after an extensive psychiatric evaluation. The following is a transcript of the interview. Interview Log 909-01 Interviewed Maintenance Worker Grant Ellis Full Name Undisclosed Interviewer Dr. Forward Grant Ellis had been taken to the infirmary for psychiatric evaluation and treatment for three days prior to the interview. Subject appears to have made a steady recovery. Begin Interview Log Hello, Mr. Ellis. How are we feeling? Yeah. A lot better. It's pretty jarring to be back here again, having proper days and times and stuff like that. I wanted to ask you about that, actually. What exactly was it like in there? In that thing? It was fucking annoying as hell, and scary. Really fucking scary. I don't do well in tight spaces, Doc. Oh. Could you please elaborate? I got taken inside this tube thing. At first I thought it was that thing's stomach or something, and I was panicking like hell because I thought I was going to get digested or something. But then I noticed this music playing. It was like… how do I describe it? You know those baby toys that play little electronic nursery rhymes? It was something like that coming down from the tubes. I also noticed this tube, which was bright red by the way, connected to a bright yellow tube that bent around a corner so I followed the tubes. It was a tight squeeze. I practically had to crawl my belly through these brightly colored tubes with this music blaring out from somewhere. And I just kept crawling. For three whole days? I couldn't tell what the fucking time was in that place. Everything was so bright. And no, not exactly. I came across a few colorful slides, a couple of ball pits. That's when I realized I was in some fucking Chuck E. Cheese from hell. The whole place just stank of chlorine, especially the ball pits. And the music. Fuck. The music. 
It was raging. The worst part of it all was I was sure I was being followed. Every so often I kept hearing scuttling behind me, and I swear I hear talking. They sounded like kids, but I never saw any of them. I followed the sounds but couldn't find anyone. I was getting real scared in there. How did you survive? Did you experience any hunger at all? I was starving in there, until I found one ball pit that had a whole bunch of candy bars at the bottom. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but I sure as hell wasn't going to question it. I was hungry as hell, practically stuffed my face with the stuff. Afterwards, I just sat in the ball pit, just… thinking. Wondering if this was going to be the rest of my life from now on. I started to wonder why the monster kept me alive in this place, or if I was even alive at all. And this was some weird afterlife or something. I wonder if I was the only one in here, and I just started to get really lonely. I just stared at the bright fluorescent yellow light above me, listening to that goddamn music, slowly going batshit. After that, I… I started walking, er, crawling again, through the pipes. Then I heard this weird cooing sound, like a baby, somewhere behind me. I heard something tapping or banging on the sides of the tunnel. Then I heard something come running, like scuttling through the tunnels behind me, making this shrill baby noise I can't really describe. I tried to crawl for it, but then I felt this thing come up right behind me, and it grabbed my leg, and the next thing I knew, I ended back out on the outside, with that monster blubbering away as you guys rescued me. I'm not too sure what to make of all this. But you came out of all this unharmed, correct? Aside from the emotional damage? Sure, I'm fine. I thought I was going to die on whatever that thing in the tunnels was, but I guess it helped me? Or banished me? I'm really not sure, but hey, I'm glad to be out of there. That's from damn sure. End of log. Expedition Log Expedition Log 909-01 April 15th. Forward. After having been briefed on the notes taken from the previous interview with maintenance worker Grant Ellis, CSD-5031 was fitted with audio-visual equipment in order to go into the containment chamber and enter the chest cavity while RPC-909 had been incapacitated. Begin audio log. Please proceed towards RPC-909. Remind me again why I have to make this thing angry? We've already tried using manned and robotic drones to survey the chest cavity, with zero results. We've ascertained that living personnel are able to enter the chest cavity. That's a bold claim, Doc. <sighs> well, here goes nothing. CSD-5031 reaches inside RPC-909's chest cavity before slowly climbing inside. This feels so strange. Um, Doc, there's nothing in here. I'm just sitting in this thing's chest. RPC-909 is observed shifting slightly. Oh shit, is this thing waking up? Remain calm. Perhaps it will teleport you once it's conscious. What if this thing killed me instead? Hello? Doc? RPC-909 wakes up and levitates within its containment unit the upright position tipping CSD-5031 out of the chest cavity. RPC-909 becomes startled and starts crying. Oh shit! Now it's crying! Remain calm. RPC-909 bursts into a fit of loud screeching and crying before snatching up CSD-5031, as CSD-5031 can be heard screaming. Moments later, RPC-909 shoves CSD-5031 to its chest cavity. CSD-5031 vanishes from sight as RPC-909 begins to settle down, babbling incoherently as it stares at Dr. and accompanying research team. CSD-5031, can you hear me? CSD-5031, please respond. After a moment of silence. CSD-5031 responds. I'm fine, Doc. I'm fine. I'm in those tunnels like the previous guy said. God, it's cramped in here. Okay, um, I can hear that music. That's gonna get annoying after a while. It's currently playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. 
There's some more tunnels ahead of me. And what looks like a dip below the corner. A slide, perhaps? Luckily, it seems communication between us is still working. That's something to note down for future reference. Right. All visual and audio content received on our end just fine. How's your end? I hear you loud and clear. Weird, isn't it? Very well. You may proceed. Roger that. Within the initial thirty minutes, CSD-5031 occasionally remarked on the irritating presence of the music and the cramped condition of the tunnels. After thirty minutes, CSD-5031 comes across a ball pit. Oh, thank God. Open space. Doc, I found a ball pit. Shall I go on ahead? Proceed. And remember to keep this channel clear. We wish to get any audio readings of any possible lurkers, after the reports we've had of the previous entrant being followed. Great. That makes me feel a lot better. CSD-5031 enters the ball pit, at which an audible exclamation of pain is heard. Several children, ranging from ages 4 to 13, begin to appear from the ball pit. Hey, you're an adult. What the heck? The other children chime in with agreement. Several younger children begin to throw plastic balls at CSD-5031, while another child crawls out from behind CSD-5031, crying and holding his arm. Hey, cut it out! I'm sorry, I didn't see you kids here. Several of the children continue to talk amongst themselves, with a few calling out what is assumed to be the word, Tagger, several times. The oldest child of the group proceeds to speak to CSD-5031. Who are you? How did you get in here? We didn't think adults were allowed. Well, first of all, what's your name, kid? I'm… I'm the boss around here, since I'm the oldest. Right. And what is this place? Is there a way out? You ask a lot of questions, but I don't think there's a way out. Why would we want to go out anyway? But… Don't you miss your parents? Don't you want to get out of here and go home? Home? Yes, home. With your parents. I don't know what you're talking about. You sound like a crybaby to me. A few exclamations from the other children, seeming to be in agreement with are heard all around. Okay, this is odd. Don't any of you know what I'm talking about? Your moms and dads? Parents? Crybaby? Yeah, he's a crybaby. Shut up, guys. He's too old to be a crybaby. He probably doesn't even know what that is, do you? I don't know what you're talking about, no. I'm confused. Ha! Told you guys, he's an adult. He doesn't know about how this place works. Okay, so a crybaby is someone who keeps on crying. I figured that much out. They keep crying about things like mommies and daddies and home. Like what you were saying. Whoever says things like that gets sent to the dark tunnels. But I don't know about you. You're too old and we don't get any older people around here. Did you come up with that term for these crying kids? No, the other kids said it before me. I'm just the boss of this ball pit. Are there other ball pits? Yeah, lots. But this one is ours, and we're the Packers. Points to a Packers cap on her head. I named them after my favorite team, and because we pack heat, right guys? Loud cheering is heard from the children. It's great in here. We go and raid other ball pits and steal their candy. It's super fun, and we always win. But don't you get bored? Doesn't this place make you kids go insane? And you can't just live on candy bars. Oh, please shut up. You're so boring. This is why no adults are allowed. It's great here. And you adults always ruin it. Like that ugly guy with the beard that stole our food a while ago. Ugly bearded guy, huh? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Well, tell your friend to stop stealing our food. He's not my friend. We're co-workers. Whatever. He scared us, man. We thought he was… Hey, do you know what a tagger is? You probably don't, being all new here. I don't, no. But some of you kids were calling me that. What is it? Oh, you'll love this. A tagger is like an alien with big red eyes, and it crawls through the tunnels to tag you. If you get tagged… You get sent to the dark slides, and have to climb all the way back up again. If he doesn't find you, he leaves you candy, and you win. That's why we got so much candy, because we're the best at hiding. 
Yeah. That sounds terrifying. Aren't any of you kids scared of this thing? No way, he gives us candy. But what about the monster that brought you into this place? What monster? The tagger? No, the big monster. The one with the long arms. Don't you kids remember? Look, I'll come back. Don't go anywhere. I just gotta talk to someone. Whatever. CSD-5031 proceeds to climb back inside the tunnel and gain a significant distance from the ball pit before speaking again. Doc, did you hear all that? Affirmative. Those children don't seem to recall events prior to the abduction, and this playground dimension appears to have a strong mental influence over them. Doc, would it be possible to rescue these kids? It seems highly unlikely. I want to try. Negative CSD-5031, that is not the goal of this expedition. Your objective is to survey and map out the interior of this dimension, and establish any boundaries or endpoints. But if I run into this tagger creature, follow the directive CSD-5031, do not approach this tagger. We have reason to believe that entity was what sent the maintenance worker back to our reality. If approached by this entity, your orders are to follow the kid's initiative and hide. Understood? Is that understood, CSD-5031? Sure, Doc. I understand. After approximately one hour of further exploration, CSD-5031 comes across a young child, female, aged between three to five years, crying in one of the tunnels. At this point, the audio feed cuts off. CSD-5031 is observed approaching the child, attempting to speak to her. The child appears to acknowledge and speak to CSD-5031. The words, home, are decipherable from the child's lip movements. Moments later, CSD-5031 is seen taking the child's hand and leading her through the tunnels. Approximately 30 minutes, audio communications have been re-established. CSD-5031, come in. Communications are back online. What do you think you're doing? Sorry to go against the directive, sir, but I'm taking this child with me. We're getting out of here together. CSD-5031, you are ordered not to interfere with… With all due respect, Doc, I don't give a shit. I'm not leaving these kids in this place. If there's just one kid we can save, then it's proof we can rescue the rest of them. Now I have an idea. I'm gonna find this tagger, and I'm gonna hold on to this child. I'm hoping it will teleport both of us out of here. It's going to be a stretch, but… CSD-5031, this is a ridiculous notion. Drop the child and continue with your objective. No, Doc. I refuse to leave these kids behind. Punish me when I get back. But I'm saving this kid. Over and out. CSD-5031, refuse further communication with Dr. or any of the research team. Monitors continue to show CSD-5031 and the child venturing through the tubes. After another hour goes by, audible banging is heard through the tubes, as well as a cooing sound, as described by maintenance worker Grant Ellis. After several minutes, a small humanoid being, roughly resembling the popularized appearance of a gray alien with large red eyes, appeared around the corner, halting at the presence of CSD-5031 and the child. The child in CSD-5031's custody begins to scream and cry loudly, as the entity responds in a manner similar to the cries of RPC-909. Entity is then seen frantically rushing towards CSD-5031, before visual communications are cut out, but audio briefly picks up the sounds of both the child and CSD-5031 screaming before audio communications also cut out. Moments later. Back in RPC-909's containment unit, RPC-909 ejects a thick red and brown slurry from its mouth onto the floor before crying against its containment walls. End of log. Expedition Addendum The slurry had been positively identified as the remains of CSD-5031. No additional DNA has been discovered, leading to the conclusion that the child is still trapped within RPC-909's pocket dimension. Additionally, the child identified as within the received audiovisual transcript from CSD-5031's expedition 
has been identified as who went missing on April 14, 1986, from Heartland's play area, now defunct, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Dr. has hypothesized that the Tagger Entity is a form of avatar for RPC-909 to directly interact with the children it is abducted as a form of playtime with them, and that it had figured out that CSD-5031 was attempting to rescue one of the children thus terminating him. On record, CSD-5031 is the only known death attributed to RPC-909. Further expeditions of the RPC-909's pocket dimension are currently suspended. Discovery RPC-909 was discovered after sightings of a phantom haunting of the now-defunct indoor play areas and restaurants. Following a number of child abduction reports and several surveillance tapes catching a long, pale arm dragging several children to the ball pit. The disused basement of the establishment was raided and RPC-909 was captured with the help of Dr. and Dr. Kessler. Witnesses were given Class G amnestics, and the surveillance footage was apprehended. It was at first theorized there was more than one instance of RPC-909. When on March 17, a child was discovered in RPC-909's containment chamber before being consumed into its chest cavity, matching the appearance of the recently missing from Detroit. It was then that RPC-909's anomalous abduction methods were discovered, and the containment protocol was revised. Addendum After Bunch of the initial capture and retrieval, Dr. began to have several recurring dreams about obscure, childlike fantasy realms within a confined space, similar to a gigantic indoor play area, featuring appearances by RPC-909 and the Tagger Entity Avatar. Dr. theorized that these dreams were perhaps emitted from RPC-909 itself, projected through a weak form of telepathy as a way to communicate with him. The following is a personal log from Dr. on the dream situation. I'm starting to think that this creature really is just a child. It's hard to explain, but each dream fills me with these overwhelming emotions of loneliness and a longing to have someone. I think that's why it needs the children. As for me, I'm not sure, but I had a thought. I'm essentially the one human adult being this creature has had the most visual contact with. Plus, I did help administer its toy stock, which it seems to enjoy engaging with. Though it hasn't quite figured out what half of them do. If this thing is telepathic to some extent, perhaps it could sense my objective notions towards it. Maybe it could sense I wasn't a threat. Or maybe it just seen me so many times that I'm just the most familiar person to it. Either way, I feel like it's imprinted on me, in some way almost like a young chick would to a perceived mother. It follows me about the containment unit very often, and I've been told by others on the team that it calms down the moment I enter the observation chamber. If that's the case, then perhaps RPC-909 truly is trying to communicate with me. In these dreams I've been having, or if these are mental projections by RPC-909, that what I've been shown is what I think the world inside RPC-909's chest portal is meant to be perceived as. That is, if you were a child, I saw the familiar slides and ball pits, but it was so much bigger, less cramped and claustrophobic. The place was enormous and wondrous, and the plastic balls were floating in the air. There were large, living toys that spoke and played with the kids, and everyone basically lived off of candy bars without any real nutritional need for other food. It was a paradise for kids. But what we as adults perceived was a tiny cramped place that almost felt like an intestinal tract rather than a place of genuine fun. The tagger entity was vastly different also. I was shown how it would call out and attempt to tag the children, and everyone would hide. Those that hid well had handed out a surplus of candy. Those that were found disappeared into these long, dark slides that descended into a lower level of sorts. 
I saw this was a place where the children were forced to play games with the entity, or avatar, whatever it was. But the games were not safe. These were strange and alien, at least for the children they are playing. Things I could only describe as a giant 4D Jenga tower, and ball games where the ball itself was acting on a great central pedal force. Children got hurt falling and getting smacked about with these almost animate objects. A lot of them were crying, wanting to go home. This felt more like a punishment than a game. I often wonder why this was here. Maybe the child, meaning RPC-909, just doesn't know any better. Maybe this to it was fun. I've been thinking more about this entity, and I don't think it intentionally wants to harm kids. In its own way. This is how it keeps friends and plays with them. Maybe this is all totally normal behavior to wherever this thing comes from. As it would a lot of alien creatures, we even as the Authority have barely any understanding of. Or maybe this creature is one of its kind, whose sole purpose is to play with children, even if it means forcing them to play in many cases. To us adults, it looks like a small, industrial-sized nightmare of pipes. But to a kid, it's an interactive wonderland based around what RPC-909 seems to have in its limited understanding of what kids find fun. Perhaps the ball pit motive is all it knows, or what it thinks kids will find comfortable. A place where kids don't get old and can play endlessly. But then it didn't account for those kids who missed their home, or the grown-ups that might end up in that place by accident. After all, this creature is just a child. It doesn't know any better.